Welcome everyone, welcome to Harvard University CMSA Center for Mathematical Sciences and Applications Quantum Matter in Math and Physics Seminar Series. Today it's our great honor to have a, a ring home from Argonne National Laboratory and uh, Dominic Stukinger from Technische Universität Randstad Dresden. Uh, they will both uh, give a seminars today, uh, presumably one hour for each. And they will speak about probing the standard model of particle physics using the muon anomalous magnetic moment, the G minus two. And let's welcome directly a Rain Hong. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first here, I think uh, Juven Wang uh, invited me to be here to share our great news of our experiment. So probably from the title, you can tell our experiment is about the mu anomalous uh, magnetic moment, and uh, we use it to probe the standard model of particle theory. And my talk will focus on the experiment side, and Dominic will talk about the theory side later. Uh, so probably you've heard about us in April already, because after our first release of the uh, result, we've got a lot of media coverage uh, all over the world, many different languages. And uh, our results are indeed uh, very exciting. And uh, we cannot declare there is a discovery, but indeed it's strengthened the evidence of a new physics beyond the standard model. So um, uh, long story short, uh, we measure a parameter called the mu anomaly, and uh, we use a mu to indicate that. And the, there is a previous version of the experiment at BNL Brookhaven National Lab. And our new measurement is consistent with the previous version of the experiment. And if we combine our experiment value together and the error bar will shrink further and the, um, the deviation from the experiment average to the standard model calculation now is 4.2 sigma. So it's close to the five sigma threshold to declare a discovery of new physics, uh, but we're not quite there yet. However, uh, we have only analyzed 66% six, six of the full data set we propose to take over the years. And we have already finished run two and run three. And now so it's uh, the run four is already done. So if all the other runs are analyzed, so we will keep improving this uh, experiment error bar. Uh, so in principle, the, if we keep the central value the same, uh, we, we will achieve the five sigma uh, threshold uh, soon in the next few years. So stay tuned. So uh, in my talk, I will first uh, have a brief introduction of what the magnetic moment is and what the G factor is and what the anomaly, and uh, also have a brief theoretical overview of how the mu anomalous magnetic moment is calculated in, in the standard model. And then I will focus on the experimental techniques like uh, ooh, uh, the measurement principle and the uh, muon production and storage and how we measure the anomaly. And I will also talk about the details of the analysis. So we, there are two sides of the analysis. So one is the uh, getting the precession frequency of the muon. The other one is magnetic field. So I will talk about them in details. And in the end, I will talk again about our run one results. So uh, for muon, it's a, a standard model uh, elementary particle. So it's a heavier version of the electron. So it has a, a charge and also has a spin. And the spinning charge in standard model, it carries a so on magnetic moment, so we just treat the little particle as a charge that with the, associated with a uh, little magnet. So the magnetic dipole moment mu can be expressed in this way. So the S is the spin uh, angular momentum, and uh, the E and the 2M, those are just constant factors here. And the G is a factor uh, that indicates, uh, indicates what the proportionality is. And so why we introduce these parameters there? Because um, if this S is a uh, orbital angular momentum, then the G is one. But for spin, it's, it's two. If the muon is indeed uh, a point-like particle in Dirac's theory, so G should be two. And uh, for other particles, if the, a, a particle like a proton, it's not a point-like particle. It has internal uh, constituents. So it's a mixture of uh, quarks and gluons. Uh, so it has both a combination of spins and angular momentum. And then the G is not true. Uh, however, uh, later, if we consider 
the quantum fluctuations in the quantum field theory, uh, the vacuum itself is uh, really not free of any uh, existence. It's, so uh, the quantum, uh, quantum uh, description of the vacuum is just the lowest energy uh, state of this uh, uh, interaction Lagrangian. Um, so uh, in principle, you can have fluctuations. So here you can uh, pop up uh, positrons and electron pairs and uh, quark pairs. Uh, from the uh, from nothing, so if we consider the interaction between the muon and those virtual particles, then the g factor is not two. So basically, these virtual particles affect how a muon or an electron interact with the magnetic field, and so this was first discovered in experiments. So in 1947, so in this experiment, people measured that the electron's g factor is zero two point zero zero. Uh, two, three, eight. It's a small deviation, but it is significant because the uncertainty is small. Uh, so Stringer later computes the, cor the, the correction factor based on the quantum field theory. So this is the leading order term. So in Feynman diagram, uh, instead of just a point interaction, you can exchange the incoming and outgoing electron can exchange a virtual photon there. So it forms a loop. So this first order correction is alpha over two pi. So alpha is the fine structure constant, one over 137. So if you put these numbers in, uh, you get very close to the uh, measured value in the experiment. So this is a great achievement in quantum field theory. Um, so so the, then we define the anomalous magnetic moment as the difference between the, the real magnetic moment and the ideal one. So basically G minus two, we, we call it anomalous magnetic moment. If we divide by two, so this is the, the uh, percentage change uh, or the ratio of the change relative to two. So we call that anomaly A. And so in our experiment, we measure the A of a muon. And so uh, later on, the experiment on the G factor for electron get also improved. So it can measure to the uh, you know, uh, 10 digits after the decimal point, it's the part per trillion level. And the, on the theory side, to really match that precision, people included more and more high order terms. So this is one loop. You can have two loops, three loops, and uh, also contributions from uh, other interactions like the electroweak interaction and the uh, strong interaction. Um, but uh, on the electron side, everything worked pretty well. So till now, the experiments still agree very well with the standard model uh, inter uh, prediction. Uh, so the next question to ask you is what the a, a anomaly for muon? So this is the second uh, lightest <coughs> lepton in the uh, standard model theory, so second generation particle. So, so uh, people just want to make sure this quantum field theory can apply to all the particles in the standard model. So to calculate a mu uh, to match the recent experiment precision, uh, so we need to include all higher order terms there. So besides the QED uh, contribution, only uh, electromagnetic interaction, the electroweak interaction contribution has to be calculated. And also the contribution from the QCD, uh, you know, virtual quarks and the gluon exchange. So if in any loop you have some hadron there, so it's just from the QCD. And uh, these QCD diagrams are the most difficult things to calculate. Uh, so we can categorize them into uh, two categories. So if you have a, uh, just a virtual photon links to the muon and in the middle have a blob of hydronic uh, <coughs> loops. Um, so we call this type of diagram the hydronic vacuum polarization HVP. If it is uh, you have three photons connect to a hydronic uh, blob uh, with another um, virtual photon there. So we call that hydronic light by light. So if you only look at this part, it's more like a a light scattered through a lot of quadratic interaction, and then uh, you emit two lights. So it's a light scattering through a quadratic interaction. Uh, so in real life, if they're real photons, it's not likely to happen, but they are, photo, uh, they are virtual photons, so uh, this could happen. And so, the, uh, so far, the biggest uncertainty of this calculation is from the HDD calculation. So you can tell from this, uh, from this chart. So traditionally, uh, people use the so-called the optical theorem to connect this diagram to uh, something you can measure in experiment. 
So if you cut this part of the diagram in half, it's like a you, you can have the electron positron annihilated through a virtual photon and then you made all the uh, hadrons out. So if you measure the total uh, cross section of such process, you can uh, calculate uh, the, this part of the diagram. And um, so um, using this method, we can say the uncertainty of this diagram ultimately is also experimental uncertainty. And for the hydronic light by light part, it's, uh, it's, it's, it can only be done through modeling. So recently, people also tried to uh, find the, approach, the, the data driven approaches. So to relate that to experimental values. And also, the lattice QSD calculations are developed for that too. So, the recent years, the improvement of this part of the uncertainty is also a big achievement. Uh, however, if you combine everything together, so this is the recent um, situation of the theoretical calculations. And so we have a theory initiative uh, to uh, tell us which standard model value to compare to. So recently the, their recommendation is to just combine the last most recent calculation to, to get the WP20. So this is the value we're comparing to. And so for, for everything above, they are not used in the WP20. So some are old and uh, you see all these uh, calculations of the HVP, they are purely based on the lattice QSD calculation. And for, for most of them, their error bars is not really competitive with this data-driven approaches. Uh, however, the most recent one, the, so the BMW20, the, that group released their results uh, right after we released our first experimental value. And uh, that's the first um, result that has a, you know, a comparable error bar with the data-driven approaches. So now the theory community is going to, uh, is really interested in this and uh, investigating this, uh, this approach. So th this result is kind of somewhere in between the standard model, uh, the traditional standard model prediction and our theory value. So we are not really uh, deviating from that very much, but uh, how trustworthy that is and whether they will be accepted uh, widely. So it's still um, being discussed. So in the future, we will be clear uh, how to resolve this uh, tension between the calculation and the uh, previous data-driven method. Okay, so if we are really sure this uh, deviation is indeed uh, from something beyond the sun model. So uh, in, after we include everything we can find in the sun model, it's still there is a difference. Then it's a strong indication, or we can say we discovered something beyond, beyond the sun model. And uh, why we use muon, not electron, and why it could happen the muon can uh, detect some interaction beyond the sun model, but the electron cannot. It's because the coupling with the very heavy beyond the sun model particles a scale that uh, mass square. So the muon is uh, 200 times more heavier than the electrons. So if you square, it's uh, 40,000 times more sensitive to the beyond the sun model interactions. So uh, there are many scenarios there uh, can cause a, a non-zero non um, deviation from the standard model value for muon G minus two. So here I just put a few diagrams of uh, uh, those virtual uh, supersymmetry particles. So our next speaker, Dominic, will uh, focus on this part. So he's a real expert on this uh, part of the theory. And in my talk, I will uh, just mainly talk about our experiment and how, we, how we've got that done. So this is our measurement principle. Excuse me, Ren. Yes. Uh, do you mind to also comment about the, uh, you mentioned the electric, electron and the muon. How about the tau and two minus two uh, compare the enhancement that you showed in earlier slides? Maybe just. Uh, yeah, yes. So the tau G minus two in principle is more uh, sensitive, uh, but muon has an advantage that the half life, the lifetime is about two microseconds. So uh, in accelerator systems, we boost it. So the lifetime observed in our experiment can be tens of microseconds. It's long enough for us to perform any meaningful experiment. And particularly, it's uh, long enough for us to do a precise determination. And for tau G minus two, the tau has a much, much shorter lifetime. So it's very difficult to um, really achieve a uh, precision really 
close to the muon g minus two. So that experiment was done, but the precision is not that competitive. So you know the muon is like a kind of sweet point. So it's easier to do the experiment, and it has enough sensitivity to the beyond the sound of all the interactions. Uh, so that this answers the question. Oh yes, thanks. But, but okay. that means the experimental side is easier to perform. But in theory, or maybe in in reality, maybe one can see more deviation. Is that the what my one what might expect that? Uh, can you ask the question again? Uh, do we expect to see more deviation for the tau? tau, tau? Uh, uh, I should say, if there is a sun beyond sun on the particle much heavier, then the tau is more sensitive to it. So the deviation will be bigger, but just uh, the experimentally, yes. through tau, the precision is much worse. So you cannot tell. <laughs> OK, all right. So in theory, people still can predict anyway. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Yes. So this is our measurement principle. So first, let's assume we have a uniform magnetic field. So it's out of the page. And if you put a spinning magnetic moment into the magnetic field, and initially the, uh, the momentum is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and the spin is aligned with the momentum, so it will start to precess. So we can calculate uh, how fast the uh, the momentum precess, so that's just the sector from frequency. And you, we can also calculate how fast the spin uh, precesses. So uh, if you take the difference between them, so the difference, we call that the omega a. And so that is directly proportional to a mu, the thing we want to measure. So if we can measure omega a directly, then uh, we can just measure the uh, a mu through this. So uh, it's just reading these diagrams. So if G equals two, then the momentum and the spin always align with each other. So if G is greater than two, then the spin is processing faster than the momentum. So they start to uh, deviate from each other. So we just use this effect to uh, measure omega A and A mu. So this is just a uh, normal procedure of the experiment uh, because mu decays. So we cannot uh, store them for a long time. So you have to produce them. And after they're produ produced, you just store them and immediately start the measurement. Then uh, if then we measure both the uh, um, omega A, so that's the so-called anomalous precession angular frequency and also the magnetic field. And then take the ratio and put in these, uh, uh, other constants like the mass and the charge, then you get a mu. So this is uh, just a long story short. This is our um, measurement principle. But in reality, uh, it's really hard to achieve a, uh, ultimate uh, uniform field, and the beam is not always like this. So in the experiment, we have a lot of challenges. So I will talk about them uh, in the next few slides. So the, the, our, the previous version of the experiment at BNL, they produced the uh, muon through the proton beam. So the proton beam hit the target to create pions, and the pions decays into muons. And the, uh, the good thing is, after the production of the muon, the uh, spin of the muons are all aligned with the momentum uh, before you inject to the storage ring. Then uh, in this pipeline, you just let more pions decay and uh, get rid of the, the protons. You let it, uh, inject muon into the stored ring, then you just observe the uh, precession. And because the uh, muon decay is a random process, so just uh, observe one muon, it, you cannot tell which uh, orientation the spin is. Or, so in order to measure the spin, the, the, the spin direction or see the signal of the omega A, we need to make a histogram of something. We, we, can, we can talk about that later. But at least you need a histogram, you need statistics. So um, you need a lot of muon decays to achieve a higher statistical, uh, as, uh, okay, I should say better, uh, statistical uncertainty. So the BNL experiment is limited by the statistics. So it's five, uh, 540 ppb. Uh, the total detected uh, decay positrons is nine times 10 to the nine. Uh, so to get better statistical uncertainty, we should get more muons. And also if you keep using the same beam, which means you, uh, you have to just wait a longer time. So which is not a good idea. So that's why in our version of the experiment, we need to find a place so we can have a better beam, more intense and cleaner. So to reduce both the statistical and the uh, systematic uncertainty. 
So we chose Fermilab. And so the, in Fermilab, um, we, our goal is to achieve 21 times more statistics. And so this, in this facility, uh, we have a longer beam line to let all pions decay into muons. So we have a much cleaner beam. And it also has a four times higher field frequency than the Brookhaven. So basically here we have more muons per unit time to do our measurement. So we can achieve uh, 21 times more statistics with a reasonable uh, time frame. Uh, but a part of the experiment, which is the stored ring, is inherited from the previous experiment. So for that big magnet you see uh, in this slide, and so the, the, what you see here is just the insulation layer. Below it, you have uh, iron pieces and a superconducting ring. So iron pieces was uh, disassembled and shipped piece by piece to Fermilab. But for this superconducting ring, uh, you have to ship it up as a whole. It's really difficult to disassemble and reassemble. And the shipment was also pretty challenging because uh, the superconducting coil is very brittle. So during the shipment, if the uh, deviation or the stretching between the two sides of the diameter is more than two millimeter. You can just break it. So uh, that company just uh, ensured us that this will not happen. So it's shipped from Brookhaven, from Long Island, uh, just along the coast, and then to the Mississippi River and go up the Mississippi River. So only for the last section um, near Chicago, uh, it's got on the land and it's transported by a truck through the highways and eventually arrived at Fermilab. So a lot of people observed this event. So this is uh, this was a really exciting moment for us to continue our experiment. And our collaboration, the new one Jiman Su collaboration is uh, uh, really international. People are from seven different countries, uh, 33 institutions. And uh, so now most recently we have two, uh, 200 three members. So this number fluctuates because people uh, come and go. And um, so different groups really focus on different parts of the experiment, both the theory side and the construction of the experiment and analysis. So we, we need experts from all different areas, all different fields to make this happen because this involves both the detector technology and the accelerator physics and data analysis and also a lot of electronics. Uh, because we have tons of data to collect from our equipment and store them, analyze them. Uh, so it's, it's a big job for, you know, for, for many different aspects. And so this is the facility we produce the, the muon needed by our experiment. So this part of the accelerator complex was served for the Tevatron in Fermilab before the Tevatron was uh, decommissioned. So after the decommissioning of Tevatron, this part of the uh, accelerator complex is repurposed for other experiments, so mainly for the long baseline uh, neutrino experiments. And we share the proton beams with those experiments. Uh, so everything starts from the ion source near the Wilson Hall. And first there is a lineup to accelerate the protons to 500 MeV and uh, this Yellow ring is a booster, it boosts up to 8 GV. And then those protons are injected to the old recycler uh, to bunch them. So it will form many, many bunches. And then some of the bunches uh, will be delivered to a target, a constant target to create pions. So after the pions are created, uh, it will keep going and enter this so called delivery ring. So this delivery ring was the antiproton source for Tevatron before, and they repurposed this building with uh, some modifications of the beam line, so it becomes our delivery ring. So, uh, so at this point, it's still a mixture of protons and pions and muons. So uh, this bunch will stay in the delivery ring for a few turns, and then uh, we wait for more pions to decay into muons, and the muon and the um, protons, they have the same momentum, but they have different mass. So they move at different uh, velocity. So after a few turns, the protons will be separated from the muons. And then we just kick out the, uh, the muons into our uh, experimental hall. So we have a really clean beam 
uh, with only we want very very few pions and then no protons in our uh, stored ring. Um, there may be some very very few protons, but that's not a big deal for our experiment. So just my message here is a really clean uh, muon beam, and it's not trivial to get there. And after it's entered the experimental hall, so I will talk about our uh, facility. So this tunnel links to the, the upstream accelerator facilities. So our muon beam comes from this corner of our experimental hall. So this blue ring is the big ring magnet. And you can tell this uh, silver uh, colored aluminum co uh, shaped. So that's the cryostat of the uh, superconducting coils. If you look at the cross section of this magnet, so it's a C-shaped magnet. Uh, so these uh, signs, these dots and the cross indicate the direction of the current in the superconducting coil. So it will create a uniform field in this area. And this iron yoke is to, just to confine all the magnetic field lines inside this magnet so it doesn't leak out. And also these whole pieces will make sure there's a very uniform magnetic field in, the, uh, in between this gap. And there are a few components here you can adjust, like this uh, two, um, two hats, we, say that we call them top hat. So these pieces of metals can adjust, can be adjusted in the height. So the distance between the yoke and the hat can be changed. And the position of these pole pieces can also be changed. We have wedges in this gap. You can insert them and extract them just by a few millimeters. And on the edge, you have two uh, uh, some bumps in the edge of the uh, of the pole pieces. And also on the surface, we put a lot of iron uh, strips there. So all these components are used to shim the magnet into the desired uniformity. Because here we want really PPM level of uniformity of the magnetic field. And the shimming took us uh, uh, more than a year to, uh, to get our final goal. So this picture will show, uh, this little movie will show our effort of the last few months. So I will not show this part, only the last few months when we put in all the little iron pieces to achieve our final uniformity. So you can see, uh, you know, people just try to add one section, another section, and then implement the plan for the entire ring. So then we achieved a much better magnetic field, uh, more uniform magnetic field than the previous ex experiment, which is this uh, blue line. So the RMS of the uh, fluctuations or uh, non-uniformity is probably four times better uh, than the previous experiment. So that, that's the first achievement we made as the magnetic uh, measurement team. So in this experiment, I am for, uh, on the magnetic field side. So uh, shimming the magnetic field and measuring the magnetic field, that's what I was working on. Um, so after um, talking about the magnetic field, and I will talk about the uh, vacuum chamber. So after the muon is injected into our ring, uh, it will go in the um, uh, go around the ring inside the vacuum chamber. So the entire ring's vacuum chamber is just uh, connected uh, like a toroid shape of vacuum chambers. So we have twelve pieces uh, with uh, flanges on both sides. We put them together and link them with the uh, bellows to make sure it's uh, uh, everything is aligned very well. So one challenge we faced at that time was the deformation under vacuum. So it's a big chamber. So if you pull vacuum and then the pressure from the atmosphere would deform it. And inside the vacuum chamber, we have a cage. And so it, it will give rails for the magnetic field scanner. So if we are not careful, um, this deformation will also distort this rails. So now you are not really scanning in a circle. Your, uh, this scanner will move in a very weird path. So that will introduce uh, systematic uncertainty. So that uh, so that's why we also spent a lot of effort just to make sure the vacuum chamber's deformation was uh, covered. So we installed these cages in a very special way, used some uh, screws tuned very well to make sure after we pull vacuum, the shape of the entire uh, rail for the magnetic field scanner is still a very uh, round circle. And the deviation from the circular path was measured uh, so we can account for the systematic uncertainties related to it. And, 
Uh, one yes. question. What, are yes. the colors, what, what, what do the colors imply in the, in the previous slide? Uh, the, the color? Yes, on, on, the, on the rings and also on, on the chamber side. The, what the on the chamber, this indicates the deformation. So uh, because um, you have the walls there, so after pull back in, that, that part deforms less. But in the middle here, when we're uh, further away from the wall, it deforms more. So the redder you see, the, the more more deformation. And the colors here, um, so these uh, so sectors indicates the uh, the sections of the ring with the vacuum chamber, and these uh, greens are the ports, and also there are vacuum pumps there. So just different components we need to connect to the vacuum chamber. So here we have the ports for us to uh, connect to a pump or insert some um, devices into the ring to do certain measurements. So these are. It just ports of the vacuum chamber. Okay. Oh, by the way, I have a naive question. Uh, earlier, you you have this uh, production of a muon from uh, maybe the nucleus proton decay to pion. No, not proton decays in pion. The proton hit the target and oh, this sorry, reaction, yeah, I'm they sorry, will that. produce pion. There's a proton with other things and <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah if you wait, you need to wait for years. Sorry, sorry. And then, and then you have a pion decay to uh, muon. But yes. I, I wonder whether the, 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 there's also neutrino. So whether you need to worry about this. So it's a neutrino doesn't react to magnetic field. So it's a you know it's a band pass, and the neutrino just keep going. No problem. Okay, fine. Okay, so the next part of the story is the muon injection into the uh, uniform magnetic field. And so you can tell we have a uniform magnetic field, and uh, the uh, outside is just an iron piece. So how do we get the field, uh, get the beam in? Uh, so this is a very interesting design. So at the injection point, there is a tunnel inside the iron piece. So so it, the iron is a very good magnetic conductor. So if you make a tunnel out of it, uh, the magnetic field in the tunnel is actually very very small. So the iron will just guide the magnetic field lines inside the iron piece, but in this tunnel, there's uh, almost nothing. It's just like a, you know, in electricity, you have a piece of conductor that then you make a hole in the conductor, and it's it's shielded. So similar uh, similar concept. But here, you know, because iron is not a, uh, it's just like the superconductor for magnetic field, so you still have some remaining magnetic field, but that doesn't deviate this uh, beam that much. Uh, but the complicated thing is. Whenever you get into this uh, inner wall of this, um, this C-shaped magnetic field, the beam will start to see the strong magnetic field that could, could just deviate it. So this red line is the ideal storage orbit. So if you start to bend, what, whenever it passes this uh, inner wall, this uh, blue line, then uh, we're in trouble. So we can uh, shortly it will just hit the inner wall of the vacuum chamber. So we we built a device called the inflector. So what it does is it made another tunnel just inside this strong magnetic field to make sure in inside the muon tunnel it creates another magnetic field to fully cancel the magnetic field created by the uh, superconducting oil coil outside. So make sure. The muon just keep moving without any magnetic field for about a meter and, uh, or or so, and after that, after its exit from the uh, inflector, suddenly you see the full magnetic field. Another thing is it, it does cancel the magnetic field inside it, but it could should not disturb the magnetic field outside of it because we don't want to have a big bump in inside the stored ring. So it needs a a superconducting uh, shell there to really separate the inside field and outside field. So this is a critical component in our experiment to inject a muon beam inside our uh, storage ring. And but you see this it, the injection point is still at the uh, at the radius larger than the ideal orbit. So it's not big, but it's still a few centimeters out there. So if you don't do anything after a full cycle, it will hit the back wall of the inflector. So to do that, we to correct this to make sure they store, uh, the the muon beam is stored in the central orbit of our system. Um, after a quarter 
of the of the ring, the muon is at the position of our uh, ideal orbit, but the momentum is not correct. It's towards the inner side of the ring. So there we put three pieces of uh, uh, kickers. So for the kicker, we just when the muon is there, we suddenly uh, just inject 5,000 amp through this pair of sheet to create a very strong magnetic field in the middle to adjust the momentum of the uh, injected muon beam. And after it's, uh, this turn, for the second turn, we just turn it off. So this is an indication only for the first turn, we turn on the kicker to adjust this momentum. So it's get kicked onto the correct orbit. And after that, it's just stored in the ideal orbit without hitting the inflector or anything else. So this is also a very critical uh, component of our experiment. And uh, personally, I can tell this is the most troublesome component in one one because 5,000 amp uh, through this sheet is, uh, is, is not easy to handle. So we have to store a lot of energy in a uh, so-called boom line. It's like a, a cylindrical capacitor. Then we suddenly discharge it through this sheet of sheet metals and through um, through a few resistors, they can handle this big current and we burn a lot of resistors there too. Uh, but eventually after some effort, we get it onto a, ver a working condition and in run two and run three, uh, we have an engineering overhaul. So the, uh, the behavior of this computer gets much stabler for the later ones. So uh, this is one thing um, that is not ideal in run one. And later I can also tell how much it affects our systematic uncertainty. There's a question from our yes. mm -hmm. So what about someone? Someone is raising. Please speak up. Uh, yes, I was asking uh, what the uh, injection velocity uh, or energy would be, uh, but uh, Dominic has told me that it would be about three GeV. Is that correct? Yeah, it is three GeV, and the velocity is close to speed of light. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to know whether there was any coupling between the spin motion and the orbital motion. Whether uh, that you see that. Uh, what, what motion can you see again? Say the spin again. motion and the orbital motion, the cyclotron motion. Are there is there any possibility of a coupling between the two? Was that uh, a consideration? Uh, the orbital motion and what? What the I said? Spin, the spin motion, the spin precession. Uh, yeah, that's what we measure. The spin. Yeah, uh, is there any possibility of a coupling between the two? Uh, the coupling between the two, yeah. um, there, 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 there is. So it's part of the uncertainty analysis. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So beam dy dynamics is very important factor of our analysis. So I will show that later. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And then after we inject into the ring, we kick to the uh, correct orbit. So there is one more problem to solve. Because if you only have a magnetic field, is the motion is confined uh, in the horizontal point. So it's a circular motion, but nothing is confining them vertically. So usually people just use a uh, uh, quadruple magnet to confine the, the ver vertical motion to have the uh, focusing uh, magnets there. But here, we just want the uniform magnetic field. So the vertical uh, motion has to be confined using electric field. So that's why we have four sets of uh, uh, static electric, uh, electrostatic quadruples uh, to create a very strong electric field to uh, just push the beam towards the center vertically. And so meanwhile, it still creates a horizontal uh, defocusing force, but that doesn't matter because the magnetic field will do the horizontal focusing. So in the end, you have focusing force on both the vertical side and the horizontal side. And from now you can tell if you have a uh, restoration force on both sides, it will end up with the oscillation. And this oscillation is also playing a very important role in our analysis, uh, which we don't want. So we want to reduce the oscillation, but we still need to take into account of it. And um, okay, so this is how we detect the muon decays. So the muon just uh, stored in the, in the ring uh, for a long time for many, many turns. And the spin is process processing too. And then uh, as they process, um, it will decay, decay into positrons. So the uh, emitted positrons has a lower um, momentum. So it will bend more 
towards the inner side of the ring. So we have an exit path for the emitted the positrons. And then we just put the detector right after this uh, exit path. So uh, this, this is part of the chamber, very thin wall aluminum. So it will not change the energy of the positron that much. So inside this uh, uh, detector uh, cabinet, we have an array of uh, lead fl uh, fluoride crystals. So these are uh, crystals where it can stop the positrons. When the positrons get stopped into the, in this uh, crystal, it will generate the Chernikov radiation. And the Chernikov radiation can be detected by the silicon multipliers at the back of the uh, crystal. So uh, it will read out the electric signal like this. So whenever, uh, after each uh, hit, you will see a some of the crystal get triggers. So this is a television one. We just want to show what the signal is like in the uh, in the crystals. And so we just register the hit time and the energy through uh, by integrating over this pulse. So uh, this is the our detector. So now it's the uh, okay. So just one more word about the det uh, detector. So the energy calibration of this detector is really critical because later we'll see we want to apply a threshold of the energy. So we then we count the positrons. So to make sure the uh, the gain of these detectors doesn't drift, we have a very complicated calibration system. So in this hut we have a, a laser system. Uh, then we fan out the lasers to each crystal, and then uh, we both measure the long-term stability and also the uh, short-term transient uh, uh, through a beam fill. So after we just fill the beam, uh, fill the beam in. So believe it or not, we uh, we lose more than ninety percent of the muons. So because the, during the injection, it has a momentum spread. So this ring has a really small acceptance. So most of the muons just get scattered and then go out of this, um, uh, this ring and hit somewhere and generate a lot of particles that can hit our detector. So just right after the injection, all the detectors will see a big flash. And this big flash will uh, change the gain of this uh, uh, detector because it suddenly drains a lot of current, it changes the bias voltage, it changes the gain. So we just at different times right after the injection, the laser is fired. So we can measure uh, what the change of the gain just during the fill. So this is a big correction we have to make. And after each hit with the real, um, the electron, the real electron after the beam is stabilized. After each signal, you drain some current, you also change the gain. So we, people also need to account for this gain change. So all these gain shifts are accounted for by this laser calibration system. And so the long-term uh, drift is also on the order to 10 to minus three, but uh, after we correct, uh, we can achieve 10 to minus four per hour uh, of the gain drift. So after we shift this, this is uh, uh, good for us when we do the analysis. So now uh, here comes the, uh, the interesting part of how we just, we can measure the spin precession uh, frequency omega a. So that's the anomalous precession frequency relative to the uh, momentum. So here, let's, uh, let me make sure everyone understands this. After, when we inject, it's a short pulse, but it still has a momentum spread. So after many, many turns, so these muons will just get uniform uh, distribution around the ring. So we just call the muon gas. So the, this, uh, these muons are uniformly distributed around the ring. And uh, so for each detector, it sees only a very small part of the ring. So this detector just watching this, uh, this uh, muon decays from only one section of the part of the ring. So, so basically, if you can use the detector to see the um, spin direction, so you just see, okay, the muons at that, uh, the muons at that position, you have the uh, spin spinning around this momentum because the momentum at this point is always in the tangent direction. So this is the picture. So we have a, a muon gas, and the, each detector is just watching part of the ring, and so in the muons rest frame. And this decays through the weak interaction and due to the uh, parity violation, uh, the emitted electrons are mainly uh, emitted along the muon spin. So the total for the high energy electron, for low energy, that's, a, that, that's different. But for high energy electrons, uh, because you have to 
make sure the all the emitted uh, leptons are left-handed for particle and right-handed for uh, antiparticles. So they only uh, they have a preferred direction. So this is a still a continuous distribution. It's not just along it or against it. So it has a, con uh, a continuous distribution uh, concentrated on the forward going direction. And in our lab frame, uh, these muons are ultra relativistic. It's 3 GeV, the, uh, the muons mass is only 200 uh, MeV. So uh, it has a um, large Lorentz boost. So if you emit a positron inside this muons rest frame, so the Lorentz boost will make sure in the lab frame, all the electrons are just mainly forward going. However, this angle you emit the electron inside the rest frame determines the energy of the positron in the lab frame. So this is through the Lorentz boost. And uh, so since we have a rotating muon, and so the distribution of the muon, uh, the electron direction is oscillating. So this will end up with a, a energy spectrum oscillation in the lab frame. So this shows, okay, see the muon is uh, spin is processing around the momentum. This energy distribution, energy distribution is the shape is just oscillating. And if we apply the threat show here, we only count the high energy uh, electrons we detect. Then you see the counting rate of the electron is oscillating at the frequency of omega a directly. Uh, so this is the advantage. This is how we can measure omega a directly in our experiment. Then uh, we observe this process for 700 microseconds, which is uh, about 10 times the uh, lifetime of a muon inside the ring. So after the Lorentz boost, the lifetime is about 60 or 70 uh, microseconds. So we uh, observe 10 times of the lifetime. Then you see this oscillation structure and the exponential decay. Um, so we just fit this diagram. We can extract the, the oscillation frequency of omega A. There's a question from audience. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, someone raised the hand. Still. Are you there, just Do you still have a question? Me? I uh, probably didn't put out your hand. Oh, sorry. Maybe yes. Well, actually, I have a question. Uh, I, I just put it in the chat. I said uh, recent atomic physics data show that the electron orbital g factor is also anomalous. That is, GL is not exactly equal to one. Could that also be true for the muon? And what effect might this have for the anomaly in this mean spin G? In spin G? Uh, you mean the, the, the G factor for electron? The, the orbital G for the electron is not exactly equal to one. Uh, I, I, I haven't heard about this part yet. So maybe we can decide, discuss that offline. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's an interesting thing. So here, um, uh, just I think in our analysis, we still uh, just okay. Well, where is it? So I think the formula for the sector for frequency for magnetic field that that is still uh, we're using probably for the orbital angular momentum in the atom. That's a different a different story because uh, atom is. Uh, it's, a, it's certainly around the orbit here is a uniform magnetic field. So uh, I, I feel that's a different scenario, but they may be related, maybe not. So we can discuss it offline. All right, thank you. Yeah. So just in short, we are just using the uh, asymmetry of the decay electrons inside the nuance rest frame. Then in the uh, lab frame, we are observing the, this energy shape oscillation. And then if you apply a threshold, that's the counting rate of uh, oscillation uh, we use. And we have a few other detectors here to, for us to understand the beam shape better. So before the muon gets into the ring, we have a centimeter pedal that can uh, tell us uh, the, uh, the longitudinal shape of the, uh, of the muon because here it defines our T0. So this is T equals zero for uh, our study. And also this shape of this simulation pedal output tells us the uh, temple shape of this of the muon beam. So it's a little bit like the W shape. And uh, we understand this through the beam dynamics in the 
uh, accelerator complex. And here we have a few so-called the IBMS, so that's the injection beam chip monitor. So we have signature uh, fibers there. So give us a 2D distribution of the uh, of the beam before the injection. And after it's injected into the ring, at these two locations, we have two sets of fiber hearts. They are extracted normally during the operation because this is a destructive uh, uh, detection. So, but for some special runs, we put them into the into the ring to measure the shape of the of the beam, just using these two uh, beam position uh, monitors and beam shape monitors. And another important uh, detector we have here is the tracker. We only have the trackers at these two uh, two locations. And so, before the positrons hit the uh, catarimeter. We put a set of straw trackers like this. So it's just a straw with very thin aluminized minor walls. And the inside we fill, uh, I think it's uh, uh, ethylene uh, gas. So when the positron hit it, it can generate this signal. So we have so many straws there, we can tell the position of the interaction when it hit the, hits the straw. So if we have a track of the decay positron, so we can backtrace it just based on our knowledge of the magnetic field, you can tell where is the decay position uh, when it's just emitted from the muon. So, uh, we, so just through tracking the decay positrons, we can tell the, uh, the position of the muon. And if we do have enough statistics, we can also tell the beam motion without really touching the muon beam. So that's the advantage of, the, uh, of, of these trackers. So later I will uh, tell uh, what we use for other purposes. So this is an average of the uh, beam position after uh, through the entire film. So this is average over the many, many fields already. So you can see the shape of the mule. So uh, you see it's, the mule shape is not really what we uh, think, which is ideal. The ideal case is just in the center, you have a blob of a symmetric uh, uh, distribution, but it's not. It's concentrated in the higher orbit and has a tail uh, to the lower orbit. Uh, so the reason for that is this ring is designed for um, a kind of normal operation kicker. But in our first run, the kicker is not strong as strong as we expected as designed. So that's why uh, in the end we store the beam at a higher orbit than we designed. So that also introduced some systematic uncertainty is our experiment. And um, so I think I probably don't have a lot of time left. So it seems we have answered a few questions. So I would try to rush, but I, let me see whether I can finish within, uh, within five, uh, five to 10 minutes. And um, so now I will start to talk about the magnetic field measurement. So we measure the magnetic field using uh, NMR probes. So for uh, uh, we design these probes to uh, have this shape to fill with the petroleum jelly. We have a tuning capacitor to make sure this uh, coil is tuned to the NMR frequency. And we also designed an in vacuum field scanner. So we put 17 probes inside this scanner. So all the readout electronics are in there. We have only one single cable to communicate to the outside the electronics. So uh, we also have a, a mechanical motion system to pull the scanner all around the ring to scan the magnetic field. So this is the typical uh, signal from an MR probe. So we call it free induction decay. So after you excite it, this, uh, the, the protons inside this volume will start to process. It will generate a signal like this. So if you zoom in, you see a nice sinusoidal signal. And uh, we analyzed, uh, analyzed the tens of thousands of such signals so to get the good understanding of the magnetic field. So it would just it measures the magnetic field just slice by slice. And so you can tell it's the, the shape of the magnetic field is different from position to position. And because the muon is just goes around the ring for many, many times. So, so what determines the omega A is the uh, azimuthal average magnetic field. So we anal, uh, average all these slices. So we have a 2D uh, field map. So this matters for our magnetic field averaging. And since you know the magnetic field and the um, uh, muon distribution is are both not uniform. So later we need to do a convolution between the two. 
And so since we only scan the magnetic field every three days, so in the middle, we have another 378 NMR uh, probes just at the top and the bottom of the vacuum chamber to monitor the drift of the magnetic field in between the scans. And at one position, we also install <coughs> a very well-designed calibration probe to calibrate the NMR probes inside the field scanner so we can have a very good uh, systematic uncertainty of the magnetic field measure. So in the end, we uh, do the convolution of these two distributions to get the average mag magnetic field at the B tilde. So before we really declare, we measured everything needed for the omega A, we have to get a closer look at this expression. So beside this omega A and the B, we still have a few other uh, parameters here we need to put in and everything you have to be measured and uh, everything measured has the uncertainty how to account for them and we need to find a clever way to reduce the uh, dependency on all the other parameters that we don't measure so and also for proton nmr we measure the proton precession frequency this omega p but to translate into the magnetic field then we introduce the, uh, the Planck constant and also the magnetic moment of the proton. So now we introduce a lot of other parameters uh, to, into the average magnetic field and the, into the AMU expression. So we have to account them uh, all through. So fortunately, we can make use of another measurement of the uh, electrons G factor. And so that's related to the electrons magnetic moment. So if you combine all these uh, equations together, we end up with this equation. So this omega A and omega P tilde prime. That, so that is the average NMR frequency of proton at a certain uh, temperature. And these two parameters we measure. For the rest, we can uh, express that into these parameters and the ratios. And I will not go through the details, but you can see all these ratios were measured in other experiments and their uncertainties are really, really small, much better than uh, we, what we need in our uh, experiment. So uh, these factors are, uh, are accounted for, so we only focus on these two. And so our goal is to get the statistical uncertainty below 100 parts per billion and 70 part of the brain for both systematic uncertainty of omega A and omega P prime. So uh, our ultimate goal, the total uncertainty is 140 ppb, which is a factor of four improvement over the BNL expert. Uh, so uh, what's your question? Uh, yes, my, my last question was that uh, <clears throat> in your analysis, uh, did you take into consideration the possible uh, relativistic effect on the ball magneton? Uh, which effect? Relativistic effects on the Bohr magneton. It could be different uh, relativistic energies. The Bohr magneton. Yeah, uh, the mu, mu B, yeah. Mu E? Mu B, mu B. Oh, okay, but mu B is, uh, I think it's here. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, well, but in here, the electron is at atomic energy because uh, th this is introduced just through the measurement of the um, uh, of the magnetic field in the MR system. So uh, these are not high energy um, effect. So I think that part is covered in, in these parameters. Okay, well, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so the, these mu are, the mu E is not really high energy electron. They, they are, just, uh, you know, uh, accounted for in the uh, atomic physics. Okay. The MR. Okay. Right. Okay. So this is our data set. So this is the uh, just the raw decay positrons we observed through our few runs. So we have already covered uh, four runs: run one, run two, run three, run four. And we now we only uh, just analyze the run one, run three, uh, two, three, four are still being analyzed. So uh, this uh, result is only for run one, I should say. And uh, so now uh, let me talk about how the omega A analysis is done. So after we get this histogram, as I mentioned, it just fits to a function. So the minimum number of parameters is five. So if you just fit this uh, big function with a exponential decay with uh, on top uh, with the oscillation on top of it, 
uh, we need the total normalization, the decay uh, lifetime, the A symmetry, and the omega A oscillation frequency and the phi. So if we do this, and then you, uh, it looks like a pretty good fit. But if you uh, do a Fourier transform of the residual, uh, we see many spikes here. And the striking one is at this uh, frequency called the coherent beta tron oscillation. So let me tell you what that is. So as I mentioned, this uh, muon beam after injection, it's, it has the oscillation. So this is called the base beta tron oscillation, like uh, swimming just around this uh, equilibrium orbit. And after, because this detector is only watching part of this, uh, uh, of this ring. So after each cycle, the cyclotron frequency and the CBO frequency are not the same. So after each cycle, you see the muon is at a different location. So this long wavelength uh, oscillation is called the coherent base tron oscillation. So basically, you are watching part of the ring, and you see the muon beam is moving vertically and horizontally there, just like this. So this picture, this movie uh, is obtained uh, through the uh, through the tracker. So, so uh, because the detector only detects part of the uh, of the ring, so it's so only observing part of the uh, of the ring. So if you move, so it's possible you have some muons that can get out of this fiducial. So uh, it will create an oscillation. It will modulate this n parameter here. So this is one more parameter we have to introduce uh, to account for the coherent beta tron oscillation. And the um, um, not all the muons just stay in orbit and then decay into positrons. Uh, some of the muons, one uh, their momentum is slightly different from the uh, the orbit it can uh, it can be stored. It may you know after a long time it hit the collimator and get kicked out of the stored uh, orbit. So we call them the muon losses. And so if the muon is lost, it's bent into the uh, of the ring, so it can go through two or three catarimeters, because for those catarimeters, it can fully stop the decay positrons. But for muons, it's, uh, its penetrating power is much higher. So it can go through a few um, catarimeters. So we this is a signature of the, uh, of the lost muon. So we just use this to quantify how the muons are lost through our time. So we use it, we just this is an empirical function uh, based on the measurement to account for the uh, the loss of muons. And uh, another important thing for our analysis is the event pileup. So as I mentioned, we need to count the number of uh, electrons above the certain energy threshold. But it's possible you have two low energy thresholds hit the character. So to make one pulse, it looks like a high energy one, but actually it's low energy one. And the uh, uh, the muons with different energy, they can have different phase there. So uh, if you don't account for it, and um, you can introduce a systematic shift of omega A if this phi has a time dependency. So it's important to, uh, to analyze this pileup effect and we develop a method to remove it. So after removal, uh, we can see most of the pileup effect is, uh, is accounted for. <clears throat> so in the end, after the pileup correction and uh, introducing just more fitting parameters to account for oscillations and the muon, uh, muon loss, and so we end up with 10, 10 or more than 10 or 20 fitting parameters, depending on how uh, people fit it. So we have different groups trying different methods to construct this histogram and to fit this histogram. So to make sure we don't have a systematic bias uh, due to our method. So we, uh, that's how we want to control our systematic uncertainty. But for most of the uh, fitting method, after these parameters introduced, uh, all these spikes are gone. So we have a pretty flat uh, residual. And uh, here comes the, um, the systematic uncertainty introduced by the beam dynamics. So um, uh, our expression before, only this part, assume the uniform magnetic field, no electric field, and the muon momentum is perpendicular to the magnetic field. But in reality, we don't, because the beam is oscillating, and we use the electric field to confine the, uh, confine the beam. So, so we need to use the whole expression. The expression. So you can find this in Jackson's uh, uh, electrodynamics book. And so this is very useful. So we, uh, so we have to um, really, understand these parameters to account for these corrections. Because this is a related to electric field, we call the E field correction. 
so we analyze the, our data to uh, get the understanding of uh, the distribution of this gamma factor. So essentially, that's just the momentum distribution and the position distribution. So then we know how to make the correction uh, based on our measured electric field of the electric college pulse. And uh, through the tracker, we can also tell the direction of the uh, of the muon and we put that in. So we correct this term, we call the pitch correction because it's a, it's a vertical pitching. And another effect is through the loss of muon. So the, the, the muon at different uh, phase space can have a, a different initial phase. So if some, uh, if the early phase and the later phase are different uh, and some of them are lost, so we introduce a time dependent, uh, this phase constant director. So if you have a time derivative of it, it will uh, go into this omega A. And uh, so we measured how much this muon loss depend on different uh, uh, momentum because for some systematic runs, we just inject the uh, beam with a different momentum. And so we have, uh, we can make this curve. We also measure this phase constant for different momentum injection. So then we, we can just use our data driven approach to account for this shift. So uh, this shift is about negative 11 part of bidding with uncertainty of five part of bidding. So it's not a very big number. And the bigger issue is the so-called early late effect of the phase of acceptance correlation. Just because our, uh, in our beam, it, the shape changes vertically. And uh, so throughout this storage region, because in uh, run one, we have a damaged uh, electric field resistor. So the time constant is longer than we expected. So the beam is slowly changing its vertical shape. And for different vertical slices, they have different uh, initial phase. So this introduced a time dependent phase too. So this effect is about, uh, I think it's uh, uh, this 158 part of it in uh, systematic shift with uncertainty of 75. So this chart just summarized the, the most important systematic uncertainties for um, the four data sets of run one, so for different uh, uh, run, run periods. And so in the end, the, we have 434 uh, part of the building uh, statistical and 56 uh, sys, uh, systematic uncertainty for the fitting. And with the beam dynamics is introduced these more uh, system uncertainties. So we see for now that our result is still statistical limited. So for magnetic field, uh, I think I may just skip our uh, NMR analysis. So it's uh, just to, to, to mention, we, we just don't do a Fourier transform, get the peak. We do a, a Hilbert transform to transform from the cosine to sine omega t. And uh, we do the division and do the arc tangent. We can get this fixed function. Then we fit this to a polynomial to extract the, uh, the frequency. Uh, because if the magnetic field through the probe is not uniform, then this is not a uh, linear function anymore. However, the d phi dt at t equals zero is still proportional to the average field in the, in the probe. So that's why we choose this method. And I think I've mentioned that we scan the magnetic field and for each slice, we expand this 2D function into 2D polynomials. And we, then we track how, uh, then we map the, uh, uh, the shape of these polynomials across the ring. And uh, if we have one scan at this point, so afterwards when the scanner is not there, we, we develop a method to use the monitoring probe to tell what's happening in between. So we use two uh, scans to anchor these two points, then we interpolate in between just like this. And I can show here, if you don't interpolate, uh, you may get a wrong prediction after some time. So uh, after we implement the correction, so uh, then we can correctly tell uh, when the scanner is not there, what the magnetic field is like. And um, this is how we calibrate the, uh, uh, the MR probes in the field scanner. We have this calibration probe developed with a very good shape and a high purity water sample. So, so it's uh, systematic uncertainty can be, calibrated, can be calculated very well. So we just measure the same field uh, with this calibration probe and the scanner probe. So then we can translate whatever we measure in the uh, scanner probe into this measurement with a lower uncertainty. And the systematic uncertainty due to different effects are also 
covered um, through our calculation of the based on the geometry of this calibration probe. Uh, I will not go through the details, but you can see the uncertainty is uh, really low just due to our calibration. So for the magnetic field, there are two more transient effects. So one is the um, the kicker. So when the kicker generates the big magnetic field, it uh, the eddy current in the metal around it is uh, which generates a decaying uh, magnetic field. So we use a few um, uh, Faraday magnetometers to measure this fast defect. So it decays within um, a few microseconds, but its change is on the order of a microtesla. So it's not a big change. So it introduces a uh, 27 part of a billion uh, systematic shift of our result. And the bigger annoying thing is uh, when we charge the quadrupole plates and uh, after the muon measurement, we discharge it because if you don't do it, it will generate a lot of sparks. So this charging discharging uh, of the electric uh, quadrupoles will make a, a, a mechanical motion of these plates and such motion of metal plates inside the magnetic field will generate the eddy current and the perturb the magnetic field. So this is what we observed in our uh, monitoring probes. So if you, so these slices are the time we measure the, uh, the muon decay. So if you zoom in, in our measurement system, you can see this effect can make uh, you know, up to 100 part per billion shift of the magnetic field uh, in the region we have the uh, quadruples implemented. So well, we some spent we discovered that actually a year later after the run one, and then we spent a lot of effort making a very special probe made of uh, a peak. So we put that into the magnetic field, so we can measure this effect and relate what we observe in the inside vacuum to the uh, the thing we can monitor all the time. So that is the fixed probes. So. Uh, so basically, this effect is measured, and we did a very conservative uh, uncertainty estimation. So we see a, um, some do we did some statistics to measure that at different locations and see the spread of the measurement. So we just quote that as our uncertainty, and uh, so, so this uncertainty is about ninety part of it. That's the, so far the biggest one in the magnetic field measurement. So in the future, it can be improved after we design much better ways to measure this effect and quantify this effect. Okay, so after we put everything into our equation, we, uh, we still have one more thing to talk about, that is the clock factor, because all these frequency measurements, we need a clock. And uh, for this clock, um, we blinded, which means we, we have a clock, but we don't know what number is tuned to besides two people outside of collaboration. So this is not because uh, if we constantly know what we're measuring, then people may have the tendency to uh, just stop at the result when we are agree or disagree with its previous experiment or the standard model. So these two people tuned uh, the, uh, we have, okay, so we have a GPS receiver, we have a bleeding clock, and then that feeds into this uh, uh, frequency synthesizer. So we can dial in the clock frequency then to use it. So these two people just dial in a number and then we have a panel to lock it. They have the key. So we analyzers don't know what the number is uh, until we want to uh, release the result. So during the last day, after everyone presents their analysis to make sure we understand what we're doing, then uh, our uh, um, uh, lens coordinators just open the envelope and tell us what the number is. Then we put the number into our program to then uh, we immediately see our results. So we were pretty happy. Uh, our result agreed with the previous experiment and combining our two experiments, our result is 4.2 sigma away from the standard model prediction. And so this is a summary of uh, uh, the numbers. So this is the number you should take home. And uh, also we have a lot more data coming uh, to improve it. And we have a thorough list of the systematic uh, effect that we have analyzed uh, based, on, um, uh, based on the paper we published. So we have four major publications. So the PRL uh, was out right after we released the result. Then we have three a major technical paper uh, one is about the magnetic field. So the PRD is about the uh, omega A measurement. And the PRAB is about accounting for the beam dynamics cor uh, corrections. 
And we also have uh, other technical papers about subsystem, like our uh, magnetic field scanner, and I have a paper about the AMR signal analysis, and then we have uh, the tracker uh, technical paper. So there are also more, uh, more detailed subsystem papers too. And so uh, this is our summary. Uh, we uh, measured the muon G minus two, the anomaly of muon, and it, uh, we improved the uncertainty um, from the previous experiment. And after we combine the two results, uh, we are 4.2 signals away from the sun model uh, prediction, and which is uh, not a five to declare a victory, but it is a significant to say we have strong evidence. Uh, there, are, there are some uh, beyond sun model interactions, which Dominic will talk about. Uh, in the next talk. And we also expect improvement in the uh, probably a factor two from the run two and three combined and another factor two from four and five combined. So run four is already done and the run five is uh, scheduled for next year. And so stay tuned and uh, I hope we have more good news. So here, uh, just personally, we have to thank our uh, funding agency, Department of Energy for uh, supporting our Archon work. Yeah, that's it. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Renghu, for the wonderful uh, seminar. And next will be uh, Dominic. And at the same time, I think Dominic can share the screen and audience can uh, ask questions if they have more questions to ask. And please. Okay, should I immediately begin or wait for questions to run? Yeah, any more questions? Uh, so if not, uh, so let us welcome the second speaker, uh, Professor Dominic Stukinger from the Technische Universität Dresden. And so I, I'll just uh, remind the audience, you can still interrupt and ask questions. And uh, Dominic, please take your time. It's, it's okay to go over time. Actually, you know, actually some seminars go to more than three hours. So, take your time, so. Okay, All right. I feel less good. Yeah, please, please, <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and also an honor to give this talk here, the second part uh, on theory for muon G minus two. As it was announced, I will speak a little bit about the standard model, but uh, the major part of my talk will be on possible interpretations in physics beyond the standard model scenarios of this current 4.2 sigma deviation or whatever would be the future deviation after some further improvements of the experiment and also of the standard model prediction. So in particular, the BSM part of my talk here will be based on uh, this collaboration that you see here in the middle of the slide, uh, where we did a quite extensive survey of many different motivated scenarios for physics beyond the standard model and how they perform with respect to G minus two. The outline of the talk um, is uh, this. So I will begin with a brief motivation and an overview of the standard model situation. But uh, basically, this is um, to a large extent a repetition of uh, what Ron also said before. And then I will focus on physics beyond the standard model or BSM physics. And I will first begin with quite a large set of quite general remarks, which I should think are quite important and interesting to understand uh, before going to concrete models. But then in the last third of the talk, we will discuss motivated scenarios and concrete models and draw conclusions from them. Okay, so let us begin. This is where we are now, 4.2 sigma deviation, as you heard before, and you also now know where it comes from. Let us um, look again at the definition of G minus two. So you have now seen in great detail how it is measured and how it is determined experimentally. Basically, G minus two corresponds to this relative spin rotation compared to the axis of momentum, as you see here in this uh, picture on the right where the blue arrow corresponds to the spin orientation and the red or, uh, arrow corresponds to the direction of momentum. And the relative rotation of these two arrows is directly proportional to G minus two. And this is the quantity we are interested in. 
Well, now in quantum field theory, this can be calculated extremely precisely. And the way to calculate it is by uh, using those Feynman diagrams here where the muon interacts with a photon or electromagnetic fields via loops or um, quantum fluctuations. And such Feynman diagrams can be in a modern way rewritten in terms of an effective non-renormalizable Lagrangian. And here I write the um, uh, explicit form of this non-renormalizable Lagrangian. And you see here uh, in the middle, um, psi bar times psi, uh, a bilinear in the two spinors for the muon, uh, connected by a sigma mu nu matrix and uh, connected to the field strength tensor f mu nu of the photon. And with all these different prefactors here, um, this coefficient C in this particular normalization determines both the magnetic dipole moment and also the electric dipole moment. And we are interested in the magnetic dipole moment or the deviation AMU G minus two over two. And um, this is given by the real part of this coefficient C in this effective Lagrangian normalized with minus two times the muon mass. And so you see that uh, this operator clearly corresponds to an interaction between the muon spin and the photon field or the electromagnetic field. So it's um, easy to interpret this effective Lagrangian. And by calculating such Feynman diagrams, you can map them onto the effective Lagrangian and in this way obtain a prediction for G minus two of the muon. Let us dig a little bit deeper and also write down the Lagrangian for the muon mass, which is uh, of course much simpler. And the muon mass term is simply a psi bar psi times a mass term. And um, now um, I didn't mention it before, but I indicated always also the chirality of the spinos and uh, the really very important and crucial aspect of both the muon mass and G minus two, which also gives a deep connection between the two quantities is the necessity of a chirality flip. So both obser uh, observables um, are bilinear expressions in the muon spinner where a right-handed and the left-handed spinner are directly multiplied. Both in the muon mass you have psi L bar times psi R plus the emission conjugate and in the uh, G minus two operator you have essentially the same thing um, but with a sigma mu nu in between. So this is extremely important and um, it means that two symmetries are actually broken by G minus two and by the muon mass. The first is chiral symmetry. So you can associate um, a chiral symmetry by, for example, it's not uh, unique, but for example, you can just rotate the right-handed muon spinner by a phase. Then the entire standard model would be invariant under this symmetry if it were not for the muon Yukawa coupling. And both of these uh, operators, both the muon mass and uh, G minus two, of course, are also not invariant under this chiral symmetry. So uh, this tells us that um, every contribution from any quantum field theory to the muon mass and also to G minus two must involve somehow a breaking of this chiral symmetry. And in the standard model, the only source of this breaking is the existence of the non-vanishing Yukawa coupling of the muon. Similarly, electroweak gauge invariance is also broken by both terms because, of course, in the standard model, the right-handed muon is an electroweak or uh, SU2 singlet, whereas the left-handed muon is part of an SU2 doublet. And so both of the operators that you see there are not gauge invariant under the full standard model gauge group. What we need is a breaking of gauge invariance by a Higgs mechanism or by the expectation value of some Higgs field. In the standard model, of course, this is the case. And therefore, every contribution to the muon mass is proportional to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. But we see from this comparison but uh, that the same is true also for G minus two. So every contribution in every theory and in particular in the standard model to G minus two will be proportional to some breaking of the chiral symmetry, for example, the Yukawa coupling and to the vacuum expectation value breaking electroweak gauge invariance. And so for G minus two, this leads to this interesting set of factors that you can isolate. So A mu uh, is given by, as you see at the top of the slide still, um, the coefficient C times the muon mass. And so you get one factor of the muon mass just from the definition. But then uh, for this coefficient C to be non-zero, we need a Higgs vacuum expectation value. 
and a chirality flipping parameter that I indicated in green here. And then in any theory, you can have some other couplings which are independent of those effects. And for dimensional reasons, um, the um, G minus two must then be proportional to two powers of a typical mass scale of your theory. And as I said, in the standard model, of course, this is all uh, very well known. And uh, the muon mass is just given by the Higgs vac vacuum expectation value. There is uh, only one of them in the standard model and the muon Yukawa coupling. And uh, G minus two will be determined in a similar way. So we should keep this in mind. And we will come back to this in the discussion of the standard model and also of BSM loop effects to G minus two. Okay, now the standard model is, of course, our fantastic theory of particle physics. It's actually a very old theory. It was established around 50 years ago. And uh, since then, it has been confirmed over and over again in a multitude of very, very many different experiments, probing and testing all of its aspects. And the standard model is, of course, a very deep quantum field theory. It is um, the renormalizable. It is a gauge theory. It uh, involves the phenomenon of spontaneous electroweak symmetry breaking, as we mentioned before. And all of these things, renormalizability, gauge invariance, and electroweak symmetry breaking, they give rise to very, very deep structures between the interactions. The interactions must be local, and the interactions of all gauge bosons uh, satisfy particular symmetry relations and the interactions of the Higgs bosons and the masses are also correlated. And all these predictions and all these correlations are of course tested. And so far uh, they have uh, passed every experimental test, maybe with the exception of G minus two of the muon. But what is important in particular also to mention is that G minus two of the muon, as it was already discussed, is really this, um, let's say, optimum uh, quantity which is sensitive to all particles and all forces via quantum fluctuations. It's more sensitive to heavy particles than the electron because the muon is uh, heavier by itself. Uh, it's less sensitive than G minus two of the tau lepton, but the tau lepton cannot be measured so precisely. Therefore, G minus two of the muon is really uh, one of the most precise um, observables which test all aspects of standard model physics. So let me illustrate this a little bit further here by these uh, three simple Feynman diagrams. Of course, you know that uh, the three level Feynman diagram gives directly rise to uh, G equal to two exactly, while the one loop Schwinger diagram in QED um, gives rise to the correction alpha over two pi. And let me just uh, illustrate here on this slide this uh, fact that all standard model particles contribute, even the two heaviest particles that we know, namely the Higgs boson and the top quark, they also contribute. And um, uh, they contribute, for example, via this uh, so-called Bar-Z two-loop diagram. Uh, in this two-loop diagram, uh, the muon comes along and emits a Higgs boson. The Higgs then dissociates into a top and the top quark pair which couples to the external electromagnetic field, and then it goes back via a photon to the muon. And this single Feynman diagram amounts to minus 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11. So it's very small, but even this diagram is non-zero. And it's almost uh, large enough to be, um, let's say, resolved by the current experimental position, which is of the order 10 to the minus 10. This diagram is 10 to the minus 11, so we are not quite there yet, but almost. And uh, the top quark on its own contributes also in additional Feynman diagram, and also the Higgs boson on its own contributes in additional Feynman diagrams. So we can really say that all particles and all interactions of the standard model contribute to G minus two in a relevant way. So this is now a more serious overview of the standard model, but uh, Ron has already mentioned it and explained it in quite uh, some detail. So let me be a little bit quick here. Um, as you know, um, we can split the standard model prediction into four building blocks, QED, weak contributions, hadronic vacuum polarization, and hadronic light by light contributions. All of them must be calculated and um, they have been determined by this so-called theory initiative for G minus two, which is a worldwide 
global effort with more than 100 authors and uh, they have organized uh, several workshops where all of these contributions were discussed in great detail, in particular, of course, the hadronic contributions. And um, the idea of this theory initiative is to be always conservative and uh, combine the different existing approaches in a conservative way, uh, form consensus between the different authors. And this has been done also for this first white paper, which was published last summer before uh, the first run one experimental data came out. And so to evaluate this is of course extremely difficult and many, many different quantum field theory methods are used. And so let me just highlight the methods that go into this calculation. So for example, the QED contribution uh, involves four loop and five loop Feynman diagrams with a very deep and uh, interesting mathematical and analytical and numerical structures. The weak contributions were um, historically the first full electroweak two-loop calculation in the electroweak standard model. And one also uses interesting renormalization group methods to improve the accuracy of the calculation. And for the hadronic uh, calculations, you know that one uses non-perturbative techniques. And so the vacuum polarization is traditionally calculated using unitarity and causality, giving rise to dispersion relations, which can be used to e use experimental data for E plus E minus to hadron scattering and translate it into uh, the vacuum polarization contribution to G minus two. And recently, uh, lattice QCD became available also for the hadronic vacuum polarization, but uh, so far in the Last year's white paper, Lattice QCD, has not yet been used for this quantity. And uh, Ron already also explained that the light by light contributions was traditionally an extremely tough quantity with uh, quite an uncontrolled theory uncertainty. But this is now in a much better shape because there are now three different approaches giving rise to basically consistent um, results. Namely, traditionally, one uses um, low energy hadronic models uh, where one obtained a numerical answer, but uh, the theory uncertainty was hard to quantify. And more recently, a data driven uh, methods came into play, also using dispersion relations, and um, they uh, have a more systematic way of organizing the contributions into leading and subleading, sub subleading effects, which uh, have then controlled theory uncertainties. And also, Lattice QCD is already available for this. And uh, here, this is also used in the white paper result. Excuse me, Dominic. Yeah? Let me interrupt just for a second. I noticed the YouTube live seems dropped. So let me restart the YouTube live. Uh, just make sure that everything will be okay. I'm still recording. So, do you mind? Just in case something. So let, let me restart the YouTube line. You don't need to do anything. Let me let me. Yeah. Okay, I just wait or. I just wait. You just wait for a second. Okay. And then I restart again. And I think I think now it's good. So it's also for me to re uh, introduce again. So we are grateful today to invite the representative researcher representative for the Fermilab Neon G minus two uh, collaborations. And the speakers uh, previously was uh, Rainholm from Argon National Laboratory, and now it's uh, Dominic Stoichinger from the Technische Universität Dresden to uh, speak. It's our great honor to have uh, them today. So. Uh, Please continue. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you still see my screen? I think it should yes. be all right. Yes. yes. So, um, yes, let me also be brief on this plot because it was shown already before. 
And uh, let's just reiterate uh, that you see here in the gray band. So but this is a slide by Thomas Teutner, by the way, one of uh, the steering committee of the theory initiative. So um, the gray band is the one uh, for the hadronic vacuum polarization um, based on existing um, results from two different um, long-standing collaborations. And there are some additional results uh, which use basically the same technique, but uh, plus um, hadronic models, which induces some model dependence uh, and which is therefore not used in order to remain as conservative as possible. But uh, these results here in red basically agree. And then there is this cloud of lattice results. And one of them, the BMW result is of course significantly more accurate than all the other lattice results. And uh, this is at the moment not yet used, but of course it gives rise to great hope for impressive progress for the future because uh, all the lattice collaborations that we see here are working on getting more accurate results. And uh, also the BMW result is under scrutiny comparing different intermediate results and um, details of the calculation. So this is all work in progress. Let me come back to this issue of chirality flips um, and uh, discuss the standard model contributions from this point of view. So as I said before, G minus two always involves these uh, four different factors, muon mass from the definition, vacuum expectation value, chirality flip, and then uh, other quantities. And um, in the standard model, these green factors just uh, boil down to the muon mass itself, which means that in the standard model, every contribution to G minus two naturally is proportional to the muon mass square and uh, times couplings and divided by maybe some other mass uh, square. And you see this from many different examples of the various sectors in the standard model. So for example, in the QED part of the standard model, there are diagrams with a tau lepton loop. Uh, they arise at the two loop level. So their result um, involves a two loop prefactor alpha square divided by pi square, and then a ratio muon mass square divided by the tau lepton mass square. Then these uh, hadronic light by light contributions um, cannot be completely analytically evaluated, but parts of them can be estimated in an analytical way. And then you also get a result that looks like a three loop prefactor alpha over pi cubed times the ratio muon mass square divided by f pi square. And for the weak interaction contributions, a similar story, you get a loop factor alpha over four pi times the muon mass square divided by the W or the Z mass square. And so by the way, uh, I didn't stress it before, but the weak contributions amount to 15 times 10 to the minus 10. This is of course incredibly small, but it's um, larger than the experimental and theoretical uncertainty. And therefore this is um, very important to be taken into account. And from this estimate using chirality flips, you can immediately obtain uh, the correct order of magnitude of these weak contributions. So in the standard model, these chirality flips always just give um, muon mass square factors and therefore it's not particularly illuminating to discuss them, but uh, to understand beyond the standard model physics, this chirality flip is extremely important. So this is where we are again. And now let me turn to physics beyond the standard model and begin with a set of general remarks. So um, first of all, why study physics beyond the standard model at all, if I need to mention it? Obviously, the standard model, uh, even though it's very well tested, leaves open relevant questions. And one of the um, many open questions is dark matter. We know that dark matter exists in the universe, but it cannot be part of the standard model or cannot be described by standard model particles. And therefore the question is, what is the nature of dark matter? And actually it could be that dark matter is related to G minus two or that we learn something how dark matter could be realized or could not be realized by comparing dark matter models to the G minus two result. Similarly, uh, there are many conceptual questions by looking at the standard model structure. Uh, for example, many people ask, 
what is the origin of the Higgs boson, the origin of the Higgs field, and the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking, and many, many models and extensions of the standard model are proposed um, to give partial answers or make progress in this respect. Likewise, you can ask why are there quarks and leptons in the first place? Why are there three generations of quarks and leptons? Or more technically speaking, what is the origin of the Yukawa matrices, which basically govern the flavor structure of quarks and leptons in the standard model? And again, all these questions here about the Higgs and Yukawa sector can be related to G minus two, and we might make progress on how physics beyond the standard model in those sectors can be realized by looking at G minus two. So to zoom out a little bit, we can say that the standard model prediction is now lower than the experiment by 25 times 10 to the minus 10. And the uncertainty is around 25 plus minus six times 10 to the minus 10. And the question is which models can explain it or which models cannot explain it and uh, clearly this is an extremely active area. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I will mainly use examples from our own survey. So two general points. Uh, first of all, this discrepancy is large in the sense that it's almost twice as large as the standard model weak contributions. Remember the weak contributions are 15 times 10 to the minus 10 and the deviation is 25. However, um, from the chirality flip discussion, you know that uh, G minus two is typically suppressed by two powers of um, particle masses. And therefore you would normally expect that uh, new physics contributions to G minus two are smaller than the standard model contributions. And um, therefore it's not immediately obvious how any new physics scenario could explain such a large effect. Basically, you need a more than 100% effect compared to the weak contributions, while in many other electroweak precision observable measurements, you see no effect, not even at the per mil level for physics beyond the standard model. And uh, so in many, many other experiments, new physics should be hidden, but in G minus two, we have a really large effect. How can this be possible? And for this, it is useful to look at those four properties that G minus two uh, really combines kind of uniquely. So G minus two is first of all loop induced, which uh, makes it complementary and different from collider observables where you need to produce particles directly. Um, and you need detectors which are able to see those uh, produced particles. Whereas in G minus two, we are quantum fluctuations. You are sensitive to anything that interacts with muons and uh, possibly photons. Then G minus two is a CP and flavor conserving quantity, which makes it different and complementary to electric dipole moments, which are CP violating or to many flavor processes like B2S gamma or mu 2 e gamma, which are also uh, based on dipole operators, but uh, which violate flavor conservation. And therefore uh, it can be that new physics um, itself has a maybe flavor symmetry and therefore contributes to flavor conserving quantities like G minus two, while it doesn't contribute to such flavor violating observables. And finally, again, G minus two is a chirality flipping quantity. So it connects left and right handed muons, which makes it different to many other observables like electroweak precision observables. And this could be one reason how uh, G minus two um, can get large contributions why we don't see an effect elsewhere. So in, uh, somehow you can sense from this discussion here that in order to explain G minus two in a concrete scenario or in a concrete model, you need um, to exploit these complementarities and maybe to go to specific regions in parameter spaces of models where this complementarity is maximized. And so let me just illustrate this uh, single point here with an example by looking at the connection between G minus two and flavor symmetry or CP. And uh, this uh, example is based on a paper where we studied a model called the MRSSM, which is an R symmetric supersymmetric model, but I would not like to discuss the model in great detail but just use it um, as an illustration of this fact that we need to go to special parameter regions. So the first plot um, is based on the assumption that in this particular model, 
we explain G minus two exactly. And then we ask, um, what are the possible values of flavor violating supersymmetric parameters? And there are two of them, delta R12 and delta L12, which um, govern uh, flavor violation between the first and second generation. And you see from this plot that uh, if G minus two is explained, those uh, flavor violating parameters must be at most of the order 10 to the minus four. So you are forced to go into a parameter region where flavor is almost exactly conserved, or at least you have very small values of those flavor violating parameters. And similarly, in the lower plot, uh, we look at a correlation between three different observables, namely on the X axis, we plot G minus two, and you see in the yellow region, G minus two agrees with the experiment. And on the Y axis, we plot a ratio between two different flavor violating observables. We plot the ratio of uh, mu to E conversion compared to mu to E gamma. These are both two interesting uh, observables which are measured and will also be measured more precisely in the future. And you see if G minus two is explained. So if you are on the right side of the plot, then uh, as indicated in red and blue, the ratio between the two flavor violating observables is essentially fixed. And if we know one of them, we can predict the other one. While if G minus two is uh, basically zero, then there is no correlation between the two observables and the ratio could be anything between zero and essentially infinity. So if uh, and in, in that particular case, both uh, lepton flavor violating observables are individually necessary to constrain the model parameter space. While for large G minus two, we are in this specific parameter region where the two uh, must be correlated. So this is just an illustration of this simple uh, fact. Uh, let me go on and uh, discuss now two, um, sorry, there is some something disturbing me here at the top of my screen. Let me try to get rid of this. Okay. Anyway, uh, two promising directions for physics beyond the standard model. And uh, as I said, the first one is a connection to dark matter or more generally speaking um, to dark sectors. So very clearly dark matter is motivated and uh, more generally dark sectors, which uh, couple extremely weakly to the standard model are motivated uh, both uh, theoretically and experimentally. And by uh, definition, uh, particles um, for dark matter or dark sectors are hard to see in detectors, but suppose they couple to the muon, then uh, we are quantum fluctuations and loops indeed large effects in G minus two are possible and indeed, one of the uh, primary ways how G minus two can be explained is by coupling the muon to dark matter particles and many recent papers uh, study this particular possibility. The other uh, interesting direction is that G minus two provides a window to the muon mass generation mechanism. And by this, I mean uh, really both the Higgs mechanism and the question, what is the origin of the Higgs mechanism and also of the Yukawa sector. Because as I said before, these chirality flips relate uh, the muon mass and G minus two and basically um, the same kind of physics contributes to both. And in the standard model, the muon mass arises in this very specific way by having Yukawa couplings, which couple the muon to the Higgs field and the Higgs field um, is um, arises as the minimum of the Higgs potential in the vacuum. And um, if in any extension of the standard model, either the Higgs potential or the Higgs structure or the Yukawa cup structure is modified, we uh, can easily obtain very large uh, new effects to G minus two. And conversely, by comparing theory and experiment in G minus two, we can narrow down the parameter space for such models where the muon mass generation mechanism is modified. Let me discuss this in a little bit more technical way and give now some examples of concrete models which are discussed in the literature. So at the top, you see again, the, these um, 
formulas for G minus two ion mass, vacuum expectation value, chirality flip, and um, something else. And now um, the same physics um, mechanism will also contribute to the muon mass. And here I now give a formula for typical contributions of physics beyond the standard model to the muon mass. So you would again get a contribution also from maybe new vacuum expectation values, new chirality flipping parameters and um, the other couplings. And in this way, you see that in almost every scenario for physics beyond the standard model, the contributions to G minus two and also BSM loop contributions to the muon mass are strongly correlated. And we can use this now to compare two concrete examples. So um, let me uh, first start with the electroweak standard model again. So in the electroweak standard model, we have uh, loop contributions to G minus two, where we have, for example, exchange of the W boson. In this case, um, the chirality must be flipped uh, via the normal muon mass and the muon Yukawa coupling or uh, more precisely speaking, maybe the Yukawa coupling, where, uh, which couples the muon to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. And then we get this contribution of the form loop factor times muon mass square divided by the W mass square, giving rise to those 15 times 10 to the minus 10. In many models for physics beyond the standard model, the same will happen. So in models where the chirality flipping structure is not modified, the contributions will behave in the same way. And then we are basically on the red line of the right plot here. And the red line uh, tells us as a function of the new physics mass, what is the contribution to G minus two that you can expect. And so for such models where there is no enhancement in the chirality flips, you can explain the current uh, experimental result if the new physics mass is below 100 GeV, uh, obviously it must be below even the mass of the W boson. And so it's hard to explain it with such models, but uh, still possible. Kind of the other extreme is if you have radiative generation of the muon mass. So this is also theoretically interesting. So suppose um, the entire contributions of uh, the new physics model explain the full muon mass, which means that uh, in the previous slide here, uh, the second line at the top is equal to the muon mass, which means the entire muon mass is explained by new physics loop effects. Then uh, by plugging it in, you see that G minus two is then just given by this simple ratio muon mass square divided by the new physics mass square without any additional prefactor. And then we are on the green line of the plot which means that you can explain the current deviation if the new physics mass is around two TeV, which is of course a very interesting mass scale also for the LHC. Then another very interesting scenario are leptoquarks. Leptoquarks are particles which couple directly the muon to quarks. And here in the Feynman diagram example, uh, we draw the case where the muon couples to top quarks, which are of course the heaviest quarks. And so uh, here you can have, for example, this situation that the right-handed muon couples to a leptoquark and then turns into the right-handed top quark. The top does a chirality flip. So uh, it becomes left-handed and couples to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. And this coupling is the top Yukawa coupling, which is very large. And then the left-handed top goes to the left-handed muon by reabsorbing the leptoquark. So this is very interesting because now if you work out the formula, then you get one power of the muon mass only instead of muon mass square. And instead you get a explicit factor of the top quark mass from this chirality flip here. And you get the two factors of the left and right-handed leptoquark couplings. So this is very interesting because now you could have much, much larger contributions um, than uh, without this enhanced chirality flip. And actually the contributions um, to the muon mass in such a model are now also interesting. So at the bottom, you see the contributions delta mu would be now just given by the product of the two leptoquark couplings times the top mass. So you get a contribution to the muon mass, which is not proportional to the muon mass itself. And so you could have the situation where the new physics contributions to the muon mass are actually bigger than the muon mass, which would create somehow a fine tuning. And so you can now impose 
the criterion that you do not want um, such a fine tuning or you assume the fine tuning to be absent, which would give you upper limits on the couplings in such a scenario. But anyway, this is a simple case where you have strongly enhanced chirality flips and easily large contributions to G minus two, even if the particle masses are in the TV scale. Excuse me, Dominic. Yeah? Yes. Just the laptop quark. Uh, are, are there some uh, concrete scenarios other than maybe green unified theory for the lepton quark we will discuss? Um, I will discuss a little bit uh, more in detail lepton quarks later, and I will also show you concrete plots for how the parameter space looks like. And uh, maybe then we can also speak a little bit more about this, but um, to give a preliminary answer. Um, yes, there are concrete scenarios, but you can also um, look at it from a low energy perspective where you assume without particular motivation from grand unified theories or from other um, fundamental symmetries, the existence of those laptop quarks as just additional fields with particular quantum numbers, which allow gauge invariant couplings to the standard model leptons and quarks. So in the sense or in the spirit of simplified models where you extend the standard model by one or two or three new quantum fields with specific quantum numbers, the lepto quarks automatically arise as one of the many possibilities. And um, this is one way to view it, but um, clearly they could also arise from grand unified symmetries or from other fundamental considerations. So, so there are other low energy scenarios that do not require a grand unified theory at high energy? There are, there are lepton quark possible other scenarios at the low energy yeah, I mean, there are um, the question is um, the question is what uh, you mean by requires or, or whether you um, consider those scenarios to be really extremely well motivated. I would um, honestly speaking not claim that uh, there is a low energy scenario which has the same level of um, fundamental symmetry motivation as grand unified theories which would require the existence of lepto quarks. But of course, it's not excluded that they might exist. But uh, grand unified theories are certainly the best motivation for the existence of lepto quarks. But uh, there are some recent, um, let's say, constructions where uh, specific models with lepto quarks are um, derived, which um, are, however, not coming from fundamental theory motivations, but they are designed to explain experimental facts like they are designed to explain G minus two in conjunction with um, some anomalies in B physics or in conjunction with uh, some other experimental observations. And um, there are some constructions which are more or less elegant, but uh, the motivations um, in my personal judgment are not as uh, strong as the motivation from grand unified theory. In particular, uh, so uh, to be a little bit maybe um, um, pessimistic uh, in my statement on lepto quarks. Um, what is particularly noteworthy here is this fact that what you need uh, in order to describe G minus two are specific couplings between the muon and the top quark, right? And uh, you cannot uh, simultaneously have couplings between the muon and the up quark because then you would ruin experimental agreement with. Uh, proton physics, or you cannot have uh, simultaneous couplings between the electron and the top quark, because then you would ruin agreement with the electron G minus two and so on. So this model uh, can only live or can only be viable if you have precisely couplings between the second generation lepton and third generation quark, which is a little bit artificial. However, uh, this particular scenario can easily explain G minus two. And now, of course, it's the task for model builders to come up with um, potentially good reasons why such a scenario could exist, maybe come up with a, uh, in hindsight, explanation via flavor symmetries or something like this. Um, but to my knowledge, there is uh, at the moment not um, really, really good um, explanation of, of um, something like this. But it's not excluded experimentally, and that is why for the moment, uh, we also studied and uh, many other people study similar scenarios as well, um, just to see uh, which kinds of um, low energy models and which kinds of uh, particles um, you can extend the standard model by to explain these various experimental observations. 
So, uh, another question? There's another question. Yes, <clears throat> I asked earlier if uh, the grand universe field theory or any can explain the possibility of an anomaly in G minus one, not G minus two, G minus one, or is it excluded by any symmetry? Um, I noticed that you have now repeatedly asked about G uh, of the orbital um, structure. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer this because uh, the, the difference or the problem that I have with the, um, let's say, question or with my um, answer is that, for example, from this effective field theory point of view, you can write down an effective theory which um, where g minus two is a free parameter. So you can um, g minus two for the spin um, uh, magnetic moment is not fundamentally determined by quantum field theory as such. Whereas you cannot, uh, at least to my knowledge, write down an effective theory where you would have uh, the orbital g different from one. I, I I I think this cannot be done. So the operator doesn't exist. Uh, so in in that sense, by construction, for the orbital uh, magnetic moment, um, g is is uh, equal to unity by by definition, and um, uh, it it cannot be changed by new physics. In contrast to the spin magnetic moment, and uh, that is why we are we are interested in g for the spin and not uh, for the orbital angular momentum. But maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Um, or, but, uh, but my answer is that for the orbital and for the spin magnetic moment, uh, there is really a fundamental difference in the effective field theory. And this operator that we are looking at uh, corresponding to G minus two corresponding to the spin is a dimension five operator that uh, is generated by quantum field theories at the loop level or that you can write down in non-renormalizable quantum field theories immediately. But uh, to my knowledge, there is not uh, the analog of this for the orbital G. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic. Thanks. Otherwise, um, just maybe also to wrap up the brief mentioning of grand unified theories, of course, uh, the a big issue here is this uh, mass square suppression from new physics. Um, maybe I should highlight this once more. Um, so because of uh, this mass square suppression and because of this correlation to the muon mass, whenever you say, I want that my new physics scenario does not give rise uh, to contributions to the muon mass itself, which are bigger than the muon mass, uh, then you need uh, masses below around two TeV. Um, to explain the current g minus two. Okay, this is an order of magnitude estimate. And so for sure you could also realize 10 TeV or something like this. But uh, if you have a grand unified theory where the new particles are at the gut scale, then it's practically inconceivable that they would give a, a relevant contribution to g minus two. Okay, let me now um, go on with those um, preliminary examples here. So supersymmetry is the next uh, one. Supersymmetry is, of course, extremely well known as a promising explanation of G minus two, and this is really still the case. And so uh, for supersymmetry, you have a complicated combination of effects uh, where similarly to laptop quarks, you have an enhanced chirality flip. But the difference is that the chirality flip now proceeds via Higgs enos and Wienos, the super partners of the Higgs and the W boson or the Z boson in the standard model. And the couplings of the Higgsino and the Wino are not free parameters of supersymmetry, but they are fixed in terms of standard model couplings also because of um, supersymmetry. And for all these reasons, you get an enhancement, but the exam enhancement is a little bit more subtle than in the case of laptop quarks. And it works out like this, that you will get a prefactor in those diagrams, which is the muon mass square, because one Coupling is again related to the muon Yukawa coupling, but you also get a factor of tangent beta, which is the ratio of two different Higgs vacuum expectation values that we have in supersymmetry. And so ultimately, the real enhancement of supersymmetry is this factor 10 beta, which is often assumed to lie in the range 10 or 20 or 50. And if it is in this range, 
then we are basically in the gray band here in the plot on the right, which means that we can easily explain the current deviation for G minus two if the SUSY masses are in the ballpark of a few hundred GeV, which is again very interesting from the point of view of LHC. Finally, let me also mention the two Higgs doublet model where it's even more complicated because there the leading diagrams are these two loop diagrams, but they are similar to the standard model diagram I showed in the beginning. Namely, these are these so-called bar Z diagrams where you exchange a Higgs boson between the muon line and another fermion loop, for example, a tau loop. And then if the new Higgs has a strong couplings to leptons, then you can get enhancements and this two loop diagram can give a large effect, which could be the origin of the observed deviation. Okay, so this was all preliminary. And now let's, if I still have some time, um, please tell me if I should stop or come to a conclusion, but maybe we can have 15 more minutes or so to go through a few concrete models and uh, the constraints acting on those models and to see what is really the current status of relevant examples for physics beyond the standard model. Please take your time and uh, just uh, say everything, reply everything you prepare, take your time. Okay, okay, thanks. I, I might need 15 or 20 minutes, I estimate. Right. If that's One okay. hour is fine, thanks. Cool. Okay. So the three, uh, I would not like to go through everything, but uh, I highlighted here um, MSSM, the minimal supersymmetric standard model, the two Higgs doublet model and lepto quarks. Let me discuss this in more detail and then come back to this uh, slide here. So let's begin again with lepto quarks. So we had already a small discussion on lepto quarks and they are surely motivated um, from grand unified theories, but in more generality, lepto quarks are of course uh, extremely interesting particles if we would discover them because they would give us immediately a connection between quarks and leptons. They would uh, involve a very intricate flavor structure and give us maybe insight on the origin of Yukawa matrices. Anyway, they would strongly modify the Yukawa sector of the standard model. And as we already discussed, they can explain G minus two. And now you see here a plot with a quantitative result. And here you see also a Lagrangian for these lepto quarks. So it corresponds to the Feynman diagram below. Um, uh, let me stress because um, we discussed already grand unified theories. Of course, there are many different kinds of lepto quarks. Lepto quarks could have spin zero or spin one, and they could have different quantum numbers. And here we need to assume that the lepto quarks have such a quantum number that a gauge invariant coupling to the right-handed muon and to the left-handed muon is allowed simultaneously. And uh, in the literature, such a lepto quark is called S1. And then the Lagrangian looks like this. And um, if we have these specific flavor specific couplings between the muon and the top quark, both in the left and in the right-handed sector, under all these conditions, uh, G minus two can be explained. And you see here in the plot, in blue, uh, sorry, in green, uh, the band where G minus two is explained as a function of the lepto quark mass and the lepto quark coupling. And you see, uh, there are also LHC limits on lepto quarks, which are very strong. So lepto quarks must be heavier than uh, one TeV, roughly speaking, because of course they are strongly interacting and therefore they are definitely visible at the LHC. But even if their masses are bigger than one TeV or two TeV, uh, you can easily explain G minus two with uh, perturbative couplings of the order 0.1. Here in blue, I um, um, uh, indicated this theoretical constraint I mentioned before, so where we require that the loop contribution to the muon mass is not bigger than the muon mass itself. So technically speaking, we require that uh, the shift between the MS bar mass and the pole mass is not bigger than 100%. And uh, then there is still this parameter space left where the lepto quark mass is between around one and two TeV, where we can nicely explain the G minus two deviation. So, and as a critique on this scenario, of course it's possible, but um, it's quite specific because we need this uh, specific flavor pattern 
of third and uh, third, uh, second and third generation quark and lepton couplings in both left and right handed sectors and so on. So how natural this is, is maybe in the eye of the beholder, um, but it's possible. And um, nowadays, um, many model builders also construct concrete scenarios, which explain not only G minus two, but in addition also other um, experiments like, for example, B physics anomalies. And that is actually also possible, but the models typically need to become quite baroque. Let me um, extend this a little bit and give you an outlook. So laptop quarks, as I mentioned before, can not only arise in a motivated way, from grand unified symmetries, but you can also simply line up systematically extensions of the standard model with one new quantum field, with two new quantum fields, three new quantum fields sorted according to quantum numbers. And then you can study generally quite a long list of renormalizable quantum field theory extensions of the standard model and check which of them agree with uh, the G minus two result. And then laptop quarks would be one of them and uh, it's a viable one. And you can do the same for two field extensions. And here you see a Feynman diagram with such an example of a two field extension of the standard model. So you have one scalar additional field and one additional fermion field. And in this particular case, the scalar field uh, would be a dark matter candidate, which is a stable scalar, which is neutral and the fermion um, would be heavier and it's a fermion doublet which might carry lepton number and um, uh, so in this way you would have a full loop consisting of two different new physics particles. And then you can study uh, this model and uh, it is a model which can in principle accommodate dark matter because of this stable dark matter candidate and also g minus two via this loop. And you see in the plot on the right here uh, the parameter space. Uh, so first uh, you have these two masses of the dark matter particle phi and the fermion psi. And uh, we fix a coupling of uh, the vertex here in this model to be 3.5, which is a very large value just at the limit of um, reasonable perturbativity. And uh, then you see that you can explain G minus two if the masses are in the region of 200 GeV. Again, G minus two is explained in green. And you need now quite small masses in very large couplings because this model does not have an enhanced chirality flip since the chirality can only be flipped at a standard model uh, muon uh, line and not in the new physics sector. So therefore we need these small masses. Now, of course, there are very strong LHC limits on such scenarios where you have two particles, one neutral and one charged new particle. And uh, the LHC limits are indicated in gray and blue and red. And so almost everything is excluded except for these small regions where the mass splitting is fairly small because the LHC becomes typically insensitive if the mass splittings are small. And so on the other hand, you see uh, the red line which is the contour where dark matter is explained. And uh, so you see that in principle, really you can explain everything, but just not in the same parameter space. So in order to explain dark matter correctly, the mass splitting would have to be large, but in order to accommodate LHC, the mass splitting must be small. And therefore the conclusion is that in this model, you can explain either G minus two or dark matter, but not both simultaneously in agreement with LHC. And so you can line up all models of this kind. This is just one example. And if you do it for all of them, then you see that uh, it works for none of these models. And so the general result is really that if you want to explain G minus two and dark matter simultaneously, you need at least three new quantum fields added to the standard model. So that is a quite simple and powerful result. And there was actually an extension of this result recently by that collaboration you see here at the bottom, Arkadi et al, uh, where they also looked at B physics and um, they require that the model explains G minus two dark matter and B physics data simultaneously. And then you need at least four different quantum fields um, because uh, three will even not do it. Even if you switch on all different gauge invariant couplings, uh, three fields is not sufficient. So you see that the models start getting quite baroque, which also means that um, 
the B physics anomalies from LHC and uh, G minus two really push us into different directions and um, they do not point towards the same kind of new physics. So that is interesting. So now let me go to the second example, the two Higgs doublet model. And um, so the two Higgs doublet model is of course an answer to the question, what is the origin of the Higgs mechanism? What is the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking? Let us study extensions of the standard model Higgs sector and uh, the two Higgs doublet model is the simplest such extension, but it already involves quite a rich scalar potential and a rich uh, Yukawa sector with many new couplings. And uh, here, let me just uh, write down the Lagrangian for the Yukawa couplings very briefly. You can express the Yukawa couplings of the new Higgses in terms of standard model couplings times some coupling modifiers. And then you see that the standard model like Higgs, which of course exists also in that model, has modified couplings because of mixing with the new Higgses. And so um, because the LHC data tell us already that the uh, observed Higgs agrees very well with standard model predictions, we know that those mixing angles must be very small. But then you have new Higgs bosons in the model, for example, a CP odd Higgs boson A, which has new Yukawa couplings and those are really free parameters of the two Higgs doublet model. And so now there are different kinds of uh, two Higgs doublet models or different versions, so-called different types. And we are here considering a type where we have no three level flavor changing neutral currents from the Higgs sector. And then in this particular case, uh, which is called the aligned two Higgs doublet model or flavor aligned two Higgs doublet model. Uh, these coupling modifiers are simply factors zeta u d l uh, each of one factor each for the uptype sector, downtype sector, and the lepton sector. And then again, uh, we see here this far z Feynman diagram, which is the most important Feynman diagram for this model. And uh, the CP or Higgs A is the most important uh, new Higgs boson, which could be responsible for large contributions to G minus two. And so this Feynman diagram couples uh, via this A boson, the muon to for example, the tau lepton or the top quark. And if the new A boson is light enough, so not to have a mass suppression of the diagram, and if its couplings to the muon and the tau or the top are large enough, then we might explain uh, the observed G minus two from this model. Okay, and here is a result already at the plot on the right. You see that uh, this is the absolute maximum contribution to G minus two in this flavor aligned to X doublet model. And you see that it just about is as large as the currently observed deviation. Um, it could be a little bit larger, but not much by maximizing everything possible in this model. And you see that you can only explain the current G minus two value in this two X doublet model if this uh, CP or Higgs mass is between around 20 and 100 GeV. So quite small Higgs masses are needed. So where does this come from? It comes from many, many experimental constraints which are already in place uh, for this two Higgs doublet model where you have a light new Higgs with large couplings to the muon and to other fermions. So for example, if you have a large coupling of this A boson to the tau lepton and the top quark, then what immediately happens is that you have this LHC process where you start with gluons and then you have a top triangle loop and uh, which then produces a new Higgs boson with this large new coupling. This is the standard production process also for the standard model Higgs. And here, if the coupling is large, uh, this would be equally prominent as the standard model Higgs production. And then if the couplings to the tau leptons are large, then this produced Higgs will immediately decay into tau leptons, which are visible at the LHC. And therefore this uh, process has not been observed. And so the uh, couplings to the tau leptons and the top quarks are limited from above, which gives rise uh, to this upper limit that you see here in the plot. And for example, this feature that you see here at around 60 GeV in the plot, comes from the fact that the um, LHC limits are uh, stronger if the mass of the new Higgs is below half uh, of the mass of the standard model Higgs. And therefore you see this kink at half of the mass of the standard model Higgs, which is around 60 GeV. 
There are many more constraints, uh, even if you switch off the top loop couplings, then this LHC process would be switched off. But uh, if you have still couplings to the tau lepton of the new Higgs, then you have constraints from tau physics where tau decays, tau um, uh, lifetime is measured very precisely. Also Z boson decays into tau is measured very precisely. And for all these reasons, uh, you have upper limits uh, of, on the couplings of the new Higgs bosons to tau leptons and also to muons. And for all these reasons, you get this upper limit on the G minus two contribution in this overall model. So that means currently this is still viable, but just about, and you really need to maximize all these possible Yukawa couplings to um, between the new Higgs and um, the standard model fermions. And therefore, uh, whenever a new progress is made by uh, the LHC constraints on this Higgs production process or by tau decay measurements or even by B physics measurements, the parameter space will shrink further and maybe we can eliminate this possibility or possibly we can really discover the new Higgs if it exists and if it is responsible for G minus two. Okay, let me finally come to the last example, which is supersymmetry and the MSSM, the minimal supersymmetric standard model. So this is maybe the best motivated scenario for physics beyond the standard model at the TV scale. Supersymmetry is of course a new fundamental quantum field theory symmetry. It uh, predicts the Higgs potential, it predicts the Higgs mass, it contains a dark matter candidate. And uh, for a long time, it was known that uh, supersymmetry can give large contributions to G minus two. But nowadays we need to ask, is it still viable in view of LHC data? But actually the answer is yes, it is still viable and it can still give large contributions to G minus two. So let me briefly uh, explain the structure of LHC limits on the supersymmetry parameter space. So this is a typical plot from Atlas from the LHC on uh, mass limits for SUSY particles. And here in this particular case, you see mass limits on so-called charginos on the x-axis and neutralinos, which are at the same time dark matter candidates on the y-axis. And then there are three different ways to evade the limits basically. First is heavy masses. You could be to the right of the uh, triangular excluded region. If the chargino is heavier than 1.2 TeV, the limit is completely uh, avoided. Or small mass splittings. So you see here this wedge region between the diagonal and the yellow contour is uh, the region where the mass splitting is small and then the LHC also becomes insensitive. And so this is um, also allowed. And third, um, the limit uh, in general only applies if the decay patterns of the SOSI particles are as simple as assumed by the experimental analysis. And often this is not the case. For example, this uh, plot here applies if the Chargino uh, that is plotted here is actually a Wino, the superpartner of the W boson. However, if it were a Higgsino, the superpartner of the Higgs, then the limit just uh, wouldn't apply in the same way. So there are many ways to evade the limit and uh, we can make use of this in explaining G minus two. Let me also make some remarks on dark matter in uh, the MSSM or in supersymmetry. So a uh, very good candidate for dark matter is this lightest neutralino or the lightest SUSY particle, which is the neutralino. And if this neutralino is Bino-like, um, where the Bino is the super partner of the U1 gauge boson, this is very promising, but in order to explain dark matter correctly, in this case, one needs um, already, uh, this is known for a long time, so-called co-annihilation. So one needs small mass splittings between the dark matter particle and the next lightest particle, which uh, should be, for example, a chargino or a slepton or a stau. This is a promising way to explain dark matter. Or one could explain dark matter using Higgsino or Ovino LSP. However, in this case, um, in order to really accommodate the observed dark matter relic density, the masses must be very high, in which case G minus two will be small. Or uh, you could have Higgsino or Ovino LSP where dark matter is explained by something else, for example, by gravity nodes or by axi nodes or axions. And then uh, Higgsino and Wino LSP 
could also be a candidate to explain large G minus two. So let's make this a little bit more concrete. So here is a plot and the formula. So you see here, uh, G minus two in the MSSM can be estimated like this. So we have 25 times 10 to the minus 10, um, which is the observed deviation, roughly speaking. And you get this if you have this parameter 10 beta equal to 50, and if basically all the SUSI masses are of the order 500 GeV, which is of course an uh, interesting order of magnitude. And you can get a little bit extra enhancements if this Higgsino mass mu is heavier than the other SUSI masses, um, but uh, this formula is only roughly correct, uh, so don't take it too literally serious. Okay, so in the plot, we see an example of a parameter space where G minus two can be explained in the MSSM. Again, the green band explains G minus two and on the Y axis, you have M1, which is the dark matter mass basically. On the X axis, you have the Higgs Zeno mass mu. Okay, and the scenario that is plotted here is the one where we assume that dark matter is explained by a Beano like LSP with co-annihilation by sleptons. So we assume that there is a mass splitting of 50 GeV between the sleptons and the LSP and the dark matter particle. And uh, so the other parameters are listed here. So dark matter is explained by Stau or slepton co-annihilation. And then you see that uh, almost, uh, okay, so first of all, G minus two is explained in the green band, but the green band corresponds to a specific value 10 beta equal to 40. And if you now, scale up or down 10 beta a little bit, then you can almost explain G minus two in the entire plot region. So G minus two has a wide open parameter space. And now you will ask about LHC limits and in the entire plot, there are no LHC limits whatsoever. And the reason is that we have explained dark matter by co-annihilation, which means that we have a small mass splitting. And for this reason, the LHC is insensitive and there are no LHC limits. And so this just illustrates that uh, once you explain dark matter in the MSSM, you have automatically almost evaded the LHC limits entirely and you have a wide open parameter space for G minus two. Let me uh, also, um, Oops, sorry, to show you this plot here, which uh, contains LHC limits. So uh, it's true that the LHC excludes a large part of the SUSI parameter space. So here on the Y axis, we plot the Wino mass M2, which is the super partner mass of the W boson, the Chargino, which has quite strong and visible interactions. And therefore uh, in purple, um, this band here is excluded by LHC. And what this tells us is that really the LHC is mainly sensitive to uh, this Wino mass M2 and uh, the LHC excludes Wino masses below around 900 GeV. In the previous case, uh, the Wino mass was around one TeV, so that was allowed. But you see here that also a second region opens up, namely if the Wino mass is very small, the LHC is again insensitive because of the small mass splittings. And then we have this second uh, interesting region for explaining dark matter, namely in the region at the bottom, we explain dark matter by Bino, we know co-annihilation, which is very attractive in itself. And uh, so you see that also here, G minus two can be nicely explained. So I won't show a plot for this, but uh, there are also attractive scenarios where um, the LSP of the MSSM is either the Wino or the Higgsino. Uh, they have also wide open parameter space and G minus two can be explained rather easily without um, conflict with LHC data. But in those cases, you need to have another dark matter candidate which is outside of the MSSM. All right, let me come to the final three slides of my talk and summarize everything. So we started uh, with uh, this observation that the discrepancy is really large, uh, larger than the standard model weak contributions. And therefore it's not obvious how to explain it in physics beyond the standard model. And we should make use of those four complementary properties that G minus two is loop induced, CP and flavor conserving and chirality flipping. And this gives rise to these two different directions. Either G minus two could, uh, come from a dark sector or from dark matter, 
or from models with a strongly enhanced chirality flip, or even from both, like in the MSSM, uh, where both is combined. So which models can accommodate the large deviation? We saw uh, all of the previous examples could accommodate G minus two, so many models can do it. But in each of the models that you consider, there are really strong constraints acting on the parameter space. And you typically need to go to specific regions of parameter space, which of course means that we can really make progress and G minus two uh, tells us something about how physics beyond the standard model can be realized. Once again, this slide, so uh, this is what we discussed and uh, let me just uh, mention it once again. So in supersymmetry, specific scenarios are actually excluded. So for example, what was famous maybe 10, 20 years ago, the minimal supergravity scenario, this is now definitely excluded as an explanation of G minus two. Instead, we have those scenarios that I mentioned, for example, Beano-like dark matter plus co-annihilation mechanisms with certain mass hierarchies can do it. We know like LSP or Higgsino like LSP can do it if dark matter comes from elsewhere. In the two Higgs doublet model, this general flavor aligned model can do it. And uh, also the specific version, which is lepton specific, where we switch off the couplings to the top but retain the couplings to the tau lepton that can also do it in a small part of parameter space. But other well-known versions of the 2 x doublet model, um, maybe some of you are familiar with type one, type two, type Y, uh, they are excluded ex as explanations of G minus two. We mentioned lepto quarks and discussed them a little bit. So um, if we have these muon specific couplings to the left and right handed muons, lepto quarks are really a good explanations of G minus two. But um, generically speaking, uh, you could ask yourself, how could we obtain such a specific flavor pattern of the couplings? There are similar scenarios like so-called vector like lepton models, which I haven't mentioned here, which behave somewhat similarly to lepto quarks and which are also promising explanations of G minus two. And I didn't touch at all here at the uh, scenarios where we have light new physics like axion like particles, dark photons, and uh, Z prime, and so on. This is also interesting, but would be a talk in itself. So let me come to the conclusions. The standard model prediction for G minus two is uh, now done by this uh, worldwide theory initiative. It's an ongoing effort. Currently, we have this snapshot that you will now know, and uh, we will expect. Um, a promising progress in particular from lattice QCD and from combining and scrutinizing lattice and comparing it with a traditional dispersion relation results. And um, for BSM, we need large effects, get connections to deep questions like dark matter, or the origin of flavor and origin of the Higgs mechanism. We always have strong constraints on each model which also means that the future experiments are really promising and really important. So in particular, Higgs coupling measurements, B physics measurements, lepton flavor violation measurements, electric dipole moments, all of those experiments. And of course, um, LHC collider experiments and maybe later lepton collider experiments would be really, really important to um, combine with G minus two and to scrutinize the parameter space of all these potential explanations of G minus two. So finally, let me stress once again, the Fermilab G minus two experiment has now after 20 years really tremendously confirmed the previous uh, deviation that was discovered first at Brookhaven. The current result is statistics dominated and only 6% of the final data are used. So this is really the best possible starting point for the next few years. And so we have a promising future in this field ahead of us. So thank you very much for your attention and let me stop here. Thanks. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, uh, Professor Dominic uh, 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 Question from audience. I actually have one question first, maybe people can ask later. Uh, can you comment about the dark photon case that you just mentioned in the uh, one second last slide, but uh, uh, you didn't discuss whether is there yes. something, something you can say about in which case the dark photon might contribute? 
Yes. Um, okay. Does that dark bottom need to cover to the minimum somewhere? Or what does this dark bottom cover to? Yes. Okay, so uh, the dark photon is a quite specific scenario and a quite specific idea where we assume that there is a new, um, basically sterile vector boson uh, corresponding to a new U1 gauge group. And then uh, it does kinetic mixing with the standard model photon. And because of that, it inherits the photon couplings times epsilon. So uh, the couplings of the dark photon would always be epsilon times the normal electromagnetic couplings. And uh, therefore, it's really only a two parameter scenario where the parameters are epsilon and the mass of the dark photon. And uh, uh, in a one dimensional contour in this parameter space, the dark photon could accommodate G minus two. And uh, so that was basically a hot topic um, maybe 10 years ago or so. And uh, then suddenly many, many low energy experiments were being done uh, all over the world. And they scrutinized the parameter space along this contour. And now the entire contour is excluded. So the dark photon in this uh, simple setup does not work at all anymore as an explanation of the current G minus two. It was a very specific scenario with only kinetic mixing and um, a pure U1 gauge group. Um, uh, uh, and um, that is not possible as an explanation of G minus two. Now, of course, uh, many people look at extensions of this where you modify the dark photon couplings and uh, this goes sometimes under the name of dark Z boson where you have not only kinetic mixing, but also mass mixing, and where you might uh, say that the dark photon or the dark Z is part of a larger dark sector, for example. Uh, the question would then be, what are the decay products uh, of this dark Z? Does it decay into standard model particles, or does it decay into uh, yet other dark sector invisible particles? And depending on this, uh, some of the experimental constraints are not applicable anymore. And that is why these more complicated dark Z scenarios are still to some extent viable ex as explanations of G minus two. But one has to uh, pay attention to various experimental constraints which exist, but um, model builders have found ways around this. Um, and so generically speaking, there are still possibilities for those dark Z. Um, models. Then maybe I should also mention in this context, uh, dark Z is again still a case where the standard model particles are uncharged under the dark Z quantum number or under the dark Z U1. But then you could have, uh, let's say, what one might call Z prime gauge bosons, neutral new gauge bosons, Z prime, where, however, standard model particles are charged under the new one, U1. And uh, then an interesting gauge group, uh, which I had on the slide, I think, is this L mu minus L tau gauge group, uh, where the Z prime would have couplings to the muons and to the tau lepton, but to no other fermion in the standard model. And this is actually also a very viable scenario uh, if the mass of this dark Z particle is in the ballpark of few GeV. Uh, I, I don't know exactly by heart, but it uh, may be in the region of 10 GeV, 20 GeV, or 1 to 10 GeV, something like this, would be a viable um, mass range for this L mu minus L tau scenario. So this is also a viable scenario for these low energy um, new spin one particle explanations of G minus two. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, other questions, comments, please feel free. All right. If not, I think uh, it's already a long time. So uh, let us thank uh, uh, Reinhold and uh, Dominic Stukinger for wonderful seminar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank actually, for your in, in invitation. Thank you. Actually, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. I think uh, on September 1st, actually, we also have a speaker from a previous IS member who recall his model was uh, Nima Kanihama. If you have interest, this uh, Kazuke, I forget the last name, Kazuke, and he, he will speak again. I can forward you this information. But anyway, it's also related to this uh, Neon minus two interpretation from their model. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you.